Well, that's what this is. Wake up. You're in the middle of it. You better wake up and listen to what you're saying. Which is a morning show. Wake up. What the hell? Wake up, everyone. <laughs> All right, let's get it going on a Thursday here. Hanging out with you. DriveHubler.com Studios. KB and Andy, it's the Wake Up Call. 93.5-1075, the fan. And Kevin, we wake up this morning. That was not what I wanted to see from the Indiana Pacers. On the road, they'll finish the season 1-3 in three against the Chicago Bulls. I want to say the lowly Bulls, but the Bulls seem to have their number, and we'll talk about that. Uh, Coach Venturi going to join us as we go at 7.30. Of course, the 40-year anniversary uh, of the Colts leaving Baltimore and landing here in Indianapolis. We'll talk about it and a bunch of other nonsense in between. KB, a good morning to you, sir. You know, my initial thought, and good morning to you. Good morning, Corbin. Happy opening day as Corbin rocks yes, his sir. Atlanta Braves gear. I guess my Ellie De La Cruz team. T-shirt. I don't know. Maybe still too chilly uh, to have that on this morning. Uh, my thought last night in watching a really awful end of the first quarter, start to the second for the bench unit, and then watching really your three best scores: Tyrese Halliburton, Pascal Siakam, and Aaron Neesmith all struggle mightily. I thought to myself, "Thank the Lord we had Rick Carlisle on the show yesterday." Dude, that's it's exactly what I was, was thinking. Is that a selfish thought? <laughs> No, it's not. It's exactly what I was thinking. Exactly what I was thinking. I don't know how many times I've felt this, Andy, throughout the last few weeks, but I felt it last night. And again, I started there with just how poor the bench was. I mean, the Pacers actually got off to a somewhat decent start. Um, and the bench has really been steady as of late, if not pretty good. Oh, sure. Well, McConnell's been great. Yeah. And there's been moments, and we mentioned the Clippers game earlier in the week, where like your starters got off to the slow start, and then boom, McConnell and company ignite you and I thought last night you, that's where the game started to get away and then it bled back into the second quarter when your starters went into the game and again I thought for the first time in the last few weeks I sat there watching it and thought damn this team could use the Benedict Mather and scoring Joel hmm. this team could use that you know eight points in two minutes and 30 seconds he gets the foul line a couple times he, it was the worst offensive night of the year worst offensive night of the year for the Pacers and that's where a guy like Matherin, the microwave, the, you know, again, the guy that can just kind of fall out of bed and score for you, I thought you really felt um, his absence. So, again, at this point of the season, there's just, you know, every loss is magnified. Now, last night, you know, you had a great opportunity. A ton of teams lost around you. Um, three and two on the road trip you would have signed up for a week ago. Losing by 26 to the Bulls, though, is not what you would sign up for at all. Yeah, I mean, let me let me give you some stats. This is per our guy, Eddie Garrison, okay? So I want to give him credit. Uh, the Pacers, 99 points, fewest points they've scored in a game this season. The field goal percentage last night was 40%, okay? That's the worst shooting performance of the season. The 43 points in the first half. I mean, how many times have they went over 43 points in quarters in the first quarter uh, this season? I bet it's several times. But the 43 points in the first half, fewest points scored in a half this season. And the Pacers now 0-18 when they score that magic number. You got it of 110 points. And for me... You know, I, I sat down and I, I was pumped for this game, right? I mean, I was excited because earlier in the night, you knew that Orlando had lost uh, at home to Golden State, the Clippers and the Sixers. Now, the Clippers went on and beat Philly, and that's a good, that was a, listen, that was a big thing for the Pacers, the best thing that happened to the Pacers last night. But I'm, you know, I'm sitting down and I'm thinking, okay, I'm excited for this game. I mean, they, you know, nine games left, a true chance to be the sixth seed. Orlando loses. Hell, you could have, you know, wake up, you wake up this morning, you're a game back of them, you're a game back of that five seed. And it just seemed like they were, and I know there are reasons, and I tweeted this out, but they were a step or two slow all night. Yeah, they, I, I mean, just, they look like the final game of a road they, trip they, type of team. They did. And, and so I want to be careful here because. I, we kind of had the conversation yesterday, but there were other things going on, obviously, of, you know, three and two you would have signed up for. The problem is on the back end is this pesky Bulls team. And being one and three against a team like this, you just hope, as it pertains to being a top six seed in the playoffs, you just hope that... I know you can point to other games and, and other losses against other mediocre teams, but 
you know, recently we have seen some tough ones against Chicago, and you hope you're not sitting there. You know, you're now one in three against the Bulls, and you wish, man, wish we had just one of those games, right? Uh, and we wish we're just 500, two and two against Chicago. So I'm trying not to be too hot takey with being really, really, really disappointed in their performance because of the road trip, because of the three and two road trip. But like you mentioned, such a missed opportunity. With the Sixers losing, you could have added another game to the tally there. And Orlando losing last night, you could wake up this morning and be a game back. It's just disappointing. You know, we, we talked about this yesterday with the Pacers. It's like, wh- when are they going to take the next step? I know. They do the assignment, but they never get the extra credit. I know. And, and was last night going to be a change in that? And it wasn't. So then I sit here and I think to myself, Andy... We're 74 games into the season. <laughs> yeah, it's just not going to happen Should this season. Should we just accept yeah. it? I know. And, and, and I know. Like, look, I know. I say accept it and say you can't lose by 26 to the Bulls. Like that is – there's a level of embarrassment there. Yes, sure, there are built in the last night of the five-game road trip, nine days, however long it was. I, I can uh, totally understand that. But, like, there's a level of, like, I guess this is just who the Pacers are. And I think it's tough for sometimes us to accept that because we fall in love with – the big wins. What I mean, how did this team win four or five against the Bucks? They have, they beat the Celtics. They got to the finals of the in season tournament. Hell, we do it with the Colts. The Colts beat Baltimore this year. Yeah. The Colts beat the Chiefs the year prior. Like, we always get to that high and we're like, why can't they consistently achieve that? Well, the answer is probably because they're not one of the best teams in the league. And the reality is the Pacers are probably a 43, 45 win basketball team. They're probably the sixth seed in the East. That's not awful. I mean, at the start of the year, uh, you know, that's exactly what I had pegged for the Pacers. What was I your think, over under? Was it forty five and a half? I went with forty five uh, plus. Okay. Was the alternate win total? So I'm okay, gonna, hey, I want to be sweating it out here these last couple of weeks. <laughs> you I, really would have liked to had last night's game. Last to night be quite was honest. one I would have felt very good about. <laughs> now with eight to go, I need just I, I need a nice five hundred finish here down the stretch. Um, but, and, and, you know, it's confusing to say, like, do you accept that, Andy? Because the Siakam trade throws so much of a different angle at it in that you've created more of the win now. And it is like, you, 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 just flat out, you got to experience a seven-game playoff series. Just like point blank period. You've got to do that. And I think they will. Now, in the next 10 days, 10 days from now, a week from Sunday, they will play arguably the game of the year. And we'll see how the Heat and the Pacers operate for the next week and a half. But if you look at the standings with that tiebreaker up for grabs, that could be the difference between you're in the play-in or you're the sixth seed. And again, if you're the sixth seed, you're not going to face Giannis. You're not going to face the Celtics. You're going to have a Knicks team, a Cavs team, you know, somebody like that in round one where, you know, you're going to walk into that playoff series and think, this is not going to be 4-0. This is not going to be 4-1. This is a legit chance to win a playoff series. So, Again, I think I can look at three and two on the road trip and say, all right, that's fine, but I can still sit here on this Thursday morning and think, damn, last night was just – there's a level of embarrassment there. Yeah, I was just hoping – I mean, they had played, if you look at, you know, Golden State, but definitely the Clippers. I mean, didn't you have the feeling that, like, we were right on the cusp of feeling really, really good about them, right? You mentioned doing the uh, the extra credit. Did you guys ever have the extra credit where you could bring in clean uh, Kleenex – you get out, you got extra credit for that, Katie. Yeah. Come on, your parents were teachers, right? Yeah, bring in the, you never Gosh, had that, no. Corbin. That is such a cheap way to get extra credit. <laughs> Am I the only one? You bring in Kleenex or something like that, you get some extra credit. So Come Johnny on. Sniffles can be taken care of during <laughs> exactly. allergy season. Now, if you look at it, you know there's different numbers out there right now. Where it still stands, the Pacers has still have the best chance of being the six now in the postseason. They have a 48 percent chance of being that six seed. And even if you look at it, they, they're they about mid-level on the hardest remaining schedule. They're 17th right now uh, in the NBA. But, I, I mean, listen, I, I think both of us agree. They were just, they were right on the cusp, and we were wanting just to see, we, want, we were wanting to be selfish for a second and wanting this team to just kind of take that next step of there's a lot of feel good. Let's add to it. Let's start stringing some wins together. And they just didn't do it last night. And I know they got it to within seven, but 
I just never felt like they had the energy. You know, it wasn't, you know, I was talking to Corbin beforehand. I mean, the thing I will be, I guess, a little harsh. I know the travel's bad, but, I, I mean, they did have a day off, you know, in between. This wasn't a back-to-back. If this would have been a back-to-back, I think our tone uh, is is much different. But uh, kind of, you know, I mean, we were feeling really good about Tyrese Halliburton. We got a skip in the first quarter. Did you see it? When he hit the he first two threes. He hit the first two threes. I, I thought to myself, oh, boy, I this thought, is going to be a big, big night. And then one of his last, was it one of his last nine? Three of, ele- three? Three of 11 from three, four of 15. And there were a couple times during the game, you know, they have wide open shots. Wide, Halliburton had, boy, he had, Halliburton had a couple. Wide open Yeah, in the second quarter, you're down double digits or whatever it is. You have two, three possessions of, couple short, of great shots. In the fourth so. quarter, you see that, you think, okay, is this a guy that's, you know, whatever, uh, nine days on the road? Is that catch it up to him? For those in the building tomorrow night when LeBron and the Lakers make their one trip to Gamebridge Fieldhouse, LeBron did play last night. He didn't play Tuesday with an ankle injury. No back-to-back for the Lakers. So, um, And they've won five straight, by the way. So that sign, you know, would indicate that LeBron will be ready to go coming up tomorrow night. Again, really looking forward to Rick Venturi joining us here at about 20. As Andy said, 40 years ago tonight, the move from Baltimore, the stealth move from Baltimore to Indianapolis. I chatted with Rick Venturi last week on the phone. Hearing him describe it to me, like, I got chills. And, again, there's such a secret nature to it, and I know there's a 30 for 30 out there, the band that wouldn't die. You know, Andy, I I wasn't born when this happened. And and really, in present-day sports, you don't see this. Oh, sure. I mean, none of this is happening and none of it will ever happen again because social media is a buzz and Rick Venturi was in the thick of it as a young defensive assistant for the then Baltimore Colts. So I can't wait for that combo. And then we'll kind of flip it halfway through. We'll get his present day thoughts on how the off season's operated so far. I know he definitely has some draft thoughts. Uh, so we'll go a little old school with Rick Venturi to celebrate the 40 year anniversary and then also get a little present day as well, and we are now 36 hours away from the Purdue Boilermakers as they are now in Detroit to take on the Gonzaga Bulldogs coming up tomorrow night. Again, 739, that tip Purdue favored by five and a half. At some point today, probably a little bit later in the show, there was a comment from Trey Kaufman Wren following that win over Utah State that I wanted to make sure we got to at some point this week. Um, it honestly, to me, is... I think just a great representation and an indicator of why Purdue has had the level of success that they have had under Matt Painter. So we'll certainly play that audio uh, and expound on that coming up in a bit. Again, Gonzaga much different since that first match of Purdue uh, is different. Gonzaga's made a starting lineup change. They're a little bit bigger in the front court. Uh, They've shot the three a lot better here as of late. Uh, And that match, cannot wait for that. I think it's the one region, Andy. If you look at the four regions – and again, tonight, the left side of the bracket will get started. That'll be UConn's bracket, North Carolina's bracket, uh, if you're looking at things on the sheet of paper. I think the Midwest, Purdue, Gonzaga, Tennessee, Creighton, I think it's the one region where if any of those four got to the Final Four, yeah, you wouldn't be surprised. You wouldn't be too, no. too shocked. Gonzaga, no. maybe. But again, when you've made nine straight sweet 16s, <laughs> right. it's hard to be totally they, they shocked They would be unexpected, that. but they're a five seed. With what we've seen in the NCAA tournament, that's not crazy. No, it's just not. It is not. So Arizona, Clemson, that will lead things off tonight. Then you'll get UConn, San Diego State, and then the nightcaps are probably the juiciest matchups. Uh, That would be North Carolina and Alabama, and then, boy, you better inject the coffee if you're going ILL, INI, or if you're Tyrese Halliburton and you want to watch your Cyclones play. That is an approximately 10.09 tip. Illinois and Iowa State, just a a one-and-a-half point spread, the closest of any game here in the Sweet Six. Yeah, we got to get Clemson out of here just to get these ACC people out of here. No, this, why, this, why are you hating on the this, ACC? This revisionist history about the ACC. Get it's them out of here. It's a great conference. <laughs> conference of champions. We might need to kick out Virginia, though, for their one effort. And uh, that's the only loss for the ACC. Yeah, I don't know if so Notre Dame's allowed to say we. Put that football program well, in that ACC. Did they win Let's an talk ACC tournament it. championship? <laughs> I'm sure they did. Didn't they win like 34 <laughs> of 35 ACC football <laughs> games against those lowly opponents? Yeah, Although they did lose NC to Louisville. State. Yeah, they did. They stormed the field on you. Rick Every 40 year old man did. In 15 minutes, it is the wake up call. Good Thursday morning. Thanks for spending it with us. 93.5 and.
Hinkle Fieldhouse, April 1st and 3rd. All right, let's jump into your morning check down. Not good last night in uh, in Chicago for the Pacers. 125-99. That's your final. The Pacers now 41-33. and Still, still hanging on for that six seed right now. A game over Miami. Looks like it may be between the Heat and the Pacers for that final spot. Post game, head coach Rick Carlisle unhappy with the loss. Obviously, a, an inconsistent night for us. You know, our first and third quarters were... Pretty decent defensive quarters, but the other the other two were very poor, and so uh, you know we just paid a paid a price. You know the game was back and forth early, and then they just got a little bit of separation, and it's just we couldn't maintain a compete level that was high enough. Next up for the Pacers hosting the Lakers. That's tomorrow night, seven o'clock in Gamebridge, six thirty. Our coverage on the fan. And LeBron did play last night. For those curious, he had an ankle injury earlier in the week, uh, so he should be playing in that one again. The bench very poor last night, and your big three, your big three scores. You're expecting so much from Aaron Neesmith right now. He really struggled. Halliburton four of a million. Siakam wasn't great either. Didn't get a lot of looks. So. Just poor uh, all around for the Pacers last night. All right, tonight we mentioned the Sweet 16, the left side of the bracket. That would be your east and west regions. Arizona Clemson will get things started, 709. San Diego State, UConn, Alabama, Carolina uh, in the second session. And then Illinois and Iowa State will round out the night. Of course, the Boilers of Purdue, they are in Detroit. They'll have a practice today up there at Little Caesars Arena. 739 tomorrow night for them. A couple other items of note. We do have the finals of the NIT. We know Indiana State will be in the 7 o'clock game coming up on Tuesday from Hinkle Fieldhouse. They will take on Utah. It'll be Georgia and Seton Hall to follow that over at Hinkle. Uh, and the women's Sweet 16 uh, will take place for the Indiana women coming up tomorrow night. Again, they've got the team of all teams, the undefeated South Carolina Gamecocks. That'll be a 5 o'clock tip from nothing says NCAA regional site like Albany, New York, right? <laughs> Beautiful Albany, New York. Boy, it's got to be, what, 25 degrees there in that Albany? That yeah. sounds like Beautiful hell. I'm talking to my students trying to travel to that game. It sounds absolutely awful, their ability to try and get there. So, again, 5 o'clock tomorrow night for the uh, in Indiana women. Yeah, opening day, Major League Baseball will give you a couple. White Sox off today, Reds uh, and Nationals there, Great American Ballpark, that one at 410. Uh, bad news yesterday from the Reds, Matt McClain going to be out a while. I, I mean, I think he might be out the entire season. Shoulder surgery upcoming for him now. The Reds have way too many injuries it, to start just, the year. I mean, they haven't even started yet. You haven't even got the oblique injury or the hammy injury running to first base yet uh, for the Reds. So a couple big injuries there uh, for Cincinnati. Cardinals on the road facing the Dodgers. That one at 410 and Cubs at Rangers. The fighting Mark Dykton's coming your way at 735. Again, opening day at Victory Field, not till Tuesday. Down, I think it's in Louisville is where they'll open up uh, here this weekend starting tomorrow there for the AAA squad in town. Speaking of in town, it was 40 years ago today, the stealth operation of the Mayflowers to Baltimore, the uh, go different routes up through Pennsylvania, meet the police escort on the state line, and have the Baltimore Colts become the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, we will chat with the one and only Rick Venturi coming up in five minutes. Cannot wait for that. It is the wake-up call here on 93.5107.5 The Fan. The IHS.
Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us, hanging out with us on this Thursday, talking to some people. It seems like this week has kind of flown by a little bit. I, I don't know. Maybe it's Corbin doesn't think so waking up, but I don't know. For us, it seems that way. Uh, fun show. Scott Agnes going to join us coming up at 830. Brian Newberg going to join us. We'll talk some Purdue with him at 930 as well. But I tell you, I'm excited for this conversation. You know, KB said. I've been we, looking forward to it all we week. we got to have Coach Venturi on to talk about the 40-year anniversary. You said you got chills when he was telling you some stories on the phone. Did you not? I could uh, listen to it all day long. Well, uh, we'll do so here for the next several minutes. Uh, Rick Venturi joining us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Coach, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. You were right there in the midst of all the madness 40 years ago from Baltimore to Indianapolis. Go the go the uh, now the Indianapolis Colts. So, a uh, good morning. What are the first uh, few things that go through your mind on an anniversary such as this? Well, Andy and my good running mate, mate Cabo, I tell you it's it's really interesting. I was 38 years old, <clears throat> 2 years in the NFL. And, uh, you know, some things you, you, I kind of have to go back and check and reference. But uh, that those two days, to be honest with you, I, I remember like, you know, like they were yesterday. You know, obviously the, the impact that, uh, that those two days had on two regions of the country. But also what's forgotten is the impact that it has on you and your family and, and me, Mr. Sure. J- Jason and Marin at that time. I mean, and the – you know, the, the speed and the stealth that it was done was, you know, really, uh, it, it was it, it was just fast, quick, and in the middle of the night, as you know. Um, and, you know, you have to look at the history a little bit leading up to it, you know. You know, the Colts had, you know, those great teams in the late 50s, 60s. You know, I think the high water mark after the championships with Unitas was the 69 AFC playoff game with Burt Jones. You know, and it was a great, it was a great uh, sports city. I mean, they they used to call Memorial Sta- Stadium the biggest outdoor insane asylum in the world. You know, the Orioles had won the uh, World Series in '83, but the, the the Colts crashed and burned in 1980 and really hit the bottom in '81. And then I came in in '82, and everyone said to us, you know, don't get rooted here. You know, this is a very fluid situation. Uh, Bob Ursay is trying to get a stadium, and the stadium memorial was just so outdated, I mean, in every way. And, you know, he was trying to get that, but the chemistry, you know, with the fans and the media was already at low ebb. I mean, it was not only at low ebb, it was volatile. You know, our crowds were down. Our team was poor. It was a very difficult situation. And Bob had shot the team. You know, I think the two biggest things that I can remember, one, before I got there, and then two, when I was there, was he had, he had gone down to Jacksonville and gave a presentation in front of 50,000 fans, left in a helicopter, never talked to him again. You know, so, <laughs> you know, and this was, you know, pre-Jaguar days. And then uh, in, in the winter of 84, after the 83 season, which we made a little bit of comeback, we went from – over to seven and nine and we were seven and seven at one time so we were feeling a little bit better about ourselves but they, he had serious negotiations in february with uh, arizona and we had played a preseason game there against the falcons um you know they arizona wanted us bad coach coach kush was an icon there uh and so there were a lot of boxes that we could check and there was a weekend in february andy that uh, basically, management said, don't leave town. You know, we didn't have cell phones in those days. Don't leave town because we could become the Arizona Colts by Monday. And so, I mean, that's how close it got. And then Arizona State blew the deal because they wanted a big piece of the pie until they built a stadium in Arizona. And Bob just went bananas. It's one of those one of those classic press conferences at the airport that you guys, I'm sure, have seen tapes of. And then it got really quiet. You know, after that February thing, the explosion, it got really quiet. And it was almost as if, well, you know, just another year has passed and we'll go on. There was a murmur of Indianapolis, but that's all it was. I mean, there was no – it wasn't a big, hot rumor – and then uh, on this day, on this day, 40 years ago, 
about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, the late Hal Hunter, uh, who was my good friend and colleague, said to me, Rick, don't go home tonight. We're going to have a meeting after everybody leaves. Coach Cush is coming back in. It's going to be very important. So, okay, we're going to meet at 6. So <laughs> we were supposed to have the meeting at 6, and two guys were playing racquetball that – <laughs> that weren't going on the trip. And so we had to wait till that racquetball was finished. That's a little trivia in the move. But the, re- the meeting was held at 8.30 rather than 6. And so <clears throat> at 8.30, okay, Jim finally convenes us. And remember, we moved to Indianapolis with 20 people. They have about 7,000 people now in the building. We had seven coaches, three scouts, Jim, Pete, Bob Turpening, our video guys, our comptroller came. That was it. But we didn't even have all 20. I think we had 10 people in that meeting. And I'll never forget it. Jim clears his throat. He's at the head of the table. He clears his throat, and he says, men, the deal has been done. We're moving to Indianapolis tonight. We will move with the secrecy of moving an embassy in Washington, D.C., the trucks will be here at 11. You will assist in the move. You will tell no one, not your wives, not your girlfriends, no one. So, you know, that's another interesting one with Miss Sherry. I gave her one of those, not going to be home tonight. You know, and she goes, well, that's going to need a little explanation. And I just went, just hang on. We'll be fine. But anyway, so about, I would say about 10 o'clock, okay, Luxury uh, bus comes in, and all these kids start piling out, and you can see they're all college kids. And the significance of that was, you know, to move an embassy, what they do is they get all these college kids. They just tell them what they're going to pay them, but they don't tell them where they're going to move. Well, <laughs> once those kids got out of the bus and realized where they were, they, had no, they, had, they exactly knew where they were. Matter of fact, John Scott had to frisk them about four times. They were, <laughs> they were putting on so many jerseys, to be honest with you. But anyway, they come in at 10, and then at about 11, the Mayflower trucks from Indianapolis start rolling in one, a second one. And we had a hill that overlooked us, and that's where they rolled into at about 11 p.m., and by then, it, you know, the story had leaked. There was media. There was bright lights. But they couldn't get in. I mean, we, we basically had security and everything. And so, you know, we uh, – so, you know, the, the, then it was furious. The move was furious. Uh, we all had tasks. My job was to take down with a screwdriver every blackboard and whiteboard in the building, oh. which Miss Sherry still laughs because she doesn't think I know how to use one, to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> so wow. I did – Wow. I did my task, and then about about I'd say it was about two thirty in the morning. Jim called us all together, and he said, "Listen, now our job is done. Go home, you know, pack it up. Uh, we will fly to Indianapolis uh, on uh, I think it was Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we'll fly out of Dulles. We obviously can't fly out of Baltimore, so we'll fly out of Washington, and you know, and, and so we did, <laughs> and, and so we did. We went home." And all I can tell you, it was it's so freaky. First of all, it was a freaky night. It was just, it was bitter. It's like what you get in that Bay Area over there is you get a lot of freezing rain in the spring. It was freezing rain. It was ugly. You've seen pictures, I'm sure, sure. and videos of it. And it was an eerie night when we got home and, and all that. And by then it was crazy. Uh, but in the end, you know, we made the move. And we made the move with a with a small group like that. We made the move in Bob Ursay's plane in three station wagons. And, and the only reason we had station wagons was everything was a hard copy back then. There were no computers. So all our draft stuff, you know, was on these huge books, like the A's might be three foot long, the B's, so forth and so on. So <clears throat> all that hard copy information had to be taken in there. So we fly into Indy. Uh, they put us up at the Pickwick, which you guys, you know, Cabo, you know, is up by uh, the Beltway up on the, the northwest side. And then we opened uh, we opened business the next day right on that little grade school, the 29th. Or, no, it would have been four days later. We opened up in that little Fall Creek grade school, and that was our temporary home for a year until they got the complex ready. 
And, you know, we didn't have computers. All we had to do was plug our projectors in and we, you know, put everything on the blackboard, bring the books in. And, I mean, we were right at work. And the irony of it, you know, this kind of capsulizes it. You know, here's Bob Ursay getting hung in effigy in Baltimore. And and here he is three days later. He's walking with Hudnut down the down down in the middle of the then Hoosier Dome. <clears throat> and I think we had. You know, we had 20,000-plus people for a pep rally just four days later. So it was just – I mean, it was a crazy two nights. Like I said, I've just – I've kind of I've kind of chronicled for you almost minute by minute, and that's – you know, that, that's how it happened. Forty years ago today wow. uh, is the move to Indy. The great Rick Venturi and Coach, we can't thank you enough for your time here. And giving us those boots on the ground details from everything that happened, you know, ironically, John Smith, the CEO of Mayflower Transit, was Bill Hudnut's neighbor. That that, that was a huge yep. reason why Mayflower <laughs> was sent to Baltimore. Can I can for I say, that. can I say something about sure. that? And, and they did that for free. Mayflower did that for free. What great advertising over forty years <laughs> right. for Mayflower and you was do it? See not? the scenes, coach, <laughs> and you just pointed out of that. You know, kind of sleeting rain, the freezing rain. I mean, it just looks oh. like a horrific. Night. I'm curious, you know, what was waking up in Baltimore like? I mean, I I, I can only imagine all of a sudden you, 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 was, you go home and you almost think like your hands are dirty when you wake up the next morning, right? Oh, it was volatile. It was vicious. I mean, just remember, I mean, the staff people that weren't going, they, they left at 430 or 5 o'clock thinking they still had a job. I mean, it was not just the fans. It was people internally in the building all the staff people were gone because we, we replaced them when we got to Indianapolis, but people were gone. They were devastated. I mean, this was a once proud. Now, when we left, we it was a bad team, but this was a very, very proud, proud, you know, fan base for years and years and years that was just tremendously upset. And I, I you know, it, it, in some respects, it shouldn't have been a total surprise because it, it it wasn't really a matter as of if it, it was really a matter of when and where. Now, to chronicle this, the reason that it had to happen with the speed and the stealth that it happened was the state of Maryland knew that Ursay was serious. The Arizona threat was really serious back in February, so they were trying to get together and use the, uh, what, it, what is the term, eminent domain, mm-hmm. okay? They were trying to use that legal principle, which from a layman's standpoint simply means that the state owns the franchise and you can't move it unless we move it. We, we just had a, a minor deal there with Wilson's up there on 31 on the chicken place, the, the little market, and the, the actually the state relented and said you can stay, but they were going to do that because of traffic purposes. But that's exactly what happened. He was concerned that he didn't want to take the chance with that eminent domain. And once he had addressed that deal with Indianapolis, he was going to do it fast in the middle of the night, and we were going to get out of Dodge. And remember, the deal that Indianapolis made for the Colts is historic and is still the basis of franchise moves everywhere. It was 12 years guaranteed 48,000 fans every game. In other words, if, if, if there wasn't 48,000, Bob got paid for the 48,000. They got the complex, I think, essentially for a dollar. The stadium, he got a, a, an interest-free loan to pay off some debts that he had. And if you really look at today's movement, and it's really always about stadium. You know, everything is about stadium, and now it's about types of stadium and rebuilding neighborhoods. But that's what it, that's what it really all came down to. But, no, the, the, morning, the morning after, I was so happy to get on that plane and, uh, and, and get to Indianapolis. And, you know, for me, <clears throat> and you, you, you Cable, know my background, I mean, both Sherry and I are Illinois kids. I mean, I was raised in Decatur. She was raised in the Chicago area. You know, I went to Northwestern. She went to Marquette. I mean, I had spent uh, three, you know, three different Big Ten schools, and I had spent four years uh, at Purdue, uh, 73 through uh, 76, four years. Uh, and so we were, 
I was a little bit familiar with Indianapolis. You know, we had taken the kids down to the zoo. Uh, I had gone from a Bulls fan in Chicago to I, I, I fell in love with the ABA Pacers with uh, Roger Brown and, and Freddie Lewis and Slick. And, of course, you got, you got to know Mario and you got to know AJ pretty well as well. So, you know, we had a little bit of background. So for us, if we were going to make a move as opposed to Arizona, this was really – one that we could, you know, be happy with. My parents were still in Peoria. And so, you know, we, we were kind of coming home. Matter of fact, I tell a little story, a little anecdote that that summer, that summer of, uh, of, uh, of well, the summer of 83, uh, before the move, we had taken a trip back from Baltimore to visit my, my folks and Sherry's folks back home. And we can, of course, we came across 70. We came through Indianapolis. And I remember pointing to the Hoosier Dome and to my son, my 11-year-old, who's now a successful businessman in Indy, and I said, Jason, this would make a great USFL city. (laughs) Because, you know, the the, the thing that people must realize is that the the Indianapolis was really essentially promised an expansion team. The Welch group was running it. They basically – were promised an expansion team, but when the USFL came in, they were hot and they were getting into player wars. And so the NFL said, okay, we're going to stop. No expansion. We're going to win this deal with what we have. We're not going to expand at all. So Indianapolis is sitting there with a beautiful new stadium built and nobody to house it. So it was important for them to get an existing team because basically they were shut out and thus you know, they were able to, to consummate the deal uh, with the Ursay family and, and get us there. The great uh, Rick Venturi, coach with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline, remembering the 40-year anniversary of the Colts' move from Baltimore to Indianapolis. Uh, you mentioned all this being kept very secretive, but it was also very much known, uh, you know, Bob Ursay wanting to move the team. And you mentioned Jacksonville, you know, Memphis, Tennessee, and there were other uh, cities yep. out there that obviously wanted the Colts. When you're talking to your defensive players, what were players saying around that time with all the uncertainty and then they also had to pick up their you know wives and kids and families and move from Baltimore to Indianapolis as well yeah that's that is a good question and I've been asked that before and all I could say is those days those two years in Baltimore were just volatile Andy and they we weren't winning uh you know the team had you know really diminished and uh, it was unappreciative, unappreciated. Uh, the players on that team weren't very highly regarded by the community. Uh, things were just really, really difficult. It wasn't a great situation. For me, it was great because it was my, it was my first two years into the NFL. I was so thrilled just to be in the NFL sure. as a coach that for me, it was fine. You know, I, I was absolutely fine with it. And uh, I could fight the adversity. Adversity is my middle name. But I think with the players, it wasn't it wasn't as bad as you would think. I, I think you're implying that it was a – and it was disruptive. Don't get me wrong. There were issues in the disruption. But I think if people were honest, they were saying to themselves, this is going to be a really new start, great stadium, you know, great town. This will be – This will be really good. And I'll tell you what, those early days, uh, I don't know if you guys even can remember or your folks would, but they, we were just treated like royalty. I mean, we, there was one day, Andy, that we came in and, uh, and and Lily had a big part of it because they were a big part of the dome and they, they had representatives who were there every day at our beck and call. If we needed something, I, I remember one day they brought in a, a round table of realtors just for the coaching staff and everybody gave their pitch and you know you could decide you know (laughs) that's great i like that guy i like that i mean when does that ever happen and anything we needed we got uh it was it was it was kind of funny because we did have a nice complex believe it or not that's the only thing that we really left that was nice it was kind of a modern day complex and moving into the the grade school was was kind of challenging. I think the showers were about four and a half feet high, you know. I mean, but, but we were treated like royalty. I mean, seriously. And I was always um, 
I, I've always regretted a little bit that we didn't have the team. We thought we would be okay in 84, but we didn't have the team that could capture and kind of repay and kind of just, just embrace the greatness that Indianapolis was giving us. We didn't have that. We didn't get to, you know, we finally, we got to a play. The first playoff was in 87, but there was a couple of tough, tough years there. There's no question about it. And so, you know, I, I always had a little regret, but I mean, I think once the players got there and they realized the reception, it was like, oh my God, this is going to be a good deal. Coach, I want to continue this conversation on the other side, and I want to ask, you know, certainly a couple present-day questions. I know you've got some thoughts on the Colts offseason so far, and the draft is we're less than a month away. I will leave you and our audience with this, though, and and I know you kind of hit on it, but Jim Irsay had a tweet a few years ago describing Fall Creek Elementary School, which was located (laughs) at Kessler and Emerson, right? The old one? Right, yes. He said, uh, Colts headquarters for 16 months, uh, 84 to 85, complete with pigs, Cows and chickens painted on the walls. My office was the school library. Leaky roof, yeah. linoleum floors included, and was easily the largest office in the NFL. And now look at the NFL now. Well, yeah, it's I'll unbelievable. Tell you, I'll tell you, my yeah, my office was a classroom. We all we all just got classrooms, or our, our gym had his, and that and your classroom was your office, which would eventually for that season, be your meeting room with the players. I mean, it it was that. Now, I will say this. I will say this. I can't describe it any better than Jim, but I will say this. Um, The people who got the grounds ready, our fields, believe it or not, were very, very good, our practice fields. We had, I think we we installed about 40 yards of AstroTurf uh, if the weather was bad, but I think back then we had a, I think we had a shovel it if it snowed, to be honest with you, to go out. But yeah, it was, it was really interesting before we, you know, we moved to the palace, the then palace on 56th Street. We're learning cursive from 9 to 10 a.m. and how to stop Marino from 1 to 2 p.m. this afternoon. More with the great Rick Venturi on the other side. Unbelievable stories on the 40-year anniversary of the move from Baltimore to Indianapolis. We'll do that next with Coach Venturi. The offseason is cold season. Joe Flacco joining Anthony Richardson. Some extension, some resign. Michael Pittman Jr. He's a dang good player. Three years, $70 million. Good for Michael Pittman Jr. Defensive lineman Tyquan Lewis. Tyre Franklin. Rigoberto. Kenny Moore. Raquan Davis. Massive human being. What happens next happens here, where the cold season never ends. 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. Make the hiring process work for you. With Indeed's end-to-end hiring solution, you can attract, interview, and hire candidates all
two. Coming up in about a half an hour, Scott Agnes will join us. R- a rough one last night for the Pacers. Hanging out with you, drivehubler.com studios. Now, if you're just joining us, uh, the last 30 minutes or so has been uh, fantastic. And we still have uh, Rick Venturi, Coach Venturi here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. But the last 30 minutes or so, uh, we talked about the 40th, uh, the 40th anniversary, obviously, of the Colts from Baltimore to Indianapolis. We're going to continue that conversation here in a second, though. Coach, I know you have uh, a couple items as free agency. The draft's coming up in about a month or so, so we'll dive into all of that as well. Uh, KB and I wanted to leave a a couple minutes here open just to put a bow on the conversation from last segment. Is there anything we're missing, Coach? Uh, You know, 40 years ago, you know, the only thing I had written down that we haven't talked about is just you think back how big of a deal the NFL, you know, you could even say then was what it is now, right? And uh, what that has done and oh. obviously the winning that has come along here in Indianapolis. But what an NFL franchise means now and how big of a deal it obviously was back then. Is there anything else we missed that you wanted to hit on as today is, you know, today into tomorrow, the 40th anniversary? Actually, actually, Andy, you, you're really hitting on it right there. Um, you know, as I said, that was the beginning of, you know, of my career, 1982, you know, and I'm, I'm still hanging. I'm still at the plate, still taking my swings. And, you know, that's what, 42 years later. But I could never, I could never have envisioned how big and how powerful this league is. It's just absolutely mind-boggling, um, you know, of the 100 top television shows last year 93 are nfl football games what do we have 168 million people um you know watch the super bowl 68 million people bet on the super bowl i mean it's absolutely incredible we play a game in europe and it's sold out in 15 minutes i mean uh, you know i i think it's several things I, I i think the structure of the nfl has been built for competitive balance Um, You know, the draft is set up to inversely give you the advantages. Uh, The hard salary cap really, really matters that other sports don't have. I mean, you've got a fixed number. You either use it or you don't use it. But the idea that it's a fixed number and that we revenue share the TV contract makes every market winnable. You know, it's not like baseball. Like the Rays are opening up tonight, but the Rays – the raise money compared to the Dodgers or the Cubs or the Yankees, they're not even in the same ball game. Well, you can be in Indianapolis and in Buffalo and Green Bay and have just as great a chance to win as anybody in the league. I mean, you know, the, people ask me all the time, why do we play games in Europe? And I've always believed that Goodell would love to, on his tombstone, have it written that he globalized the NFL. I don't think that's over. I, I, I think that day may come. And the other thing is when you watch one of those games, I mean, everybody's got a jersey on. I mean, yeah. they got it's a nuts. jersey on. I mean, I mean, at the at the Taylor Swift concert in Japan, they're wearing Kelsey jerseys. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like I said, I, and Andy, you hit it for me. I am I pinch myself every day to still be a part of it. But it is, it, you know, and I just think the game itself is so telegenic. I, I think. The fact that it is the best television game. I mean, you know, hockey's a great game here, the Lightning, but it's a, it's a it's an arena game. You know, the NBA is if you're in NBA City, it's big, but it's a little bit more regionalized. But the NFL is just it's just a great TV game, and now it's 24/7. The other we're right in the middle of the uh, of the uh, uh, NCAA Champions Opening Day, and I guarantee you, after the first 10 minutes of every sports show, they'll be talking about. Uh, Daniels it's pro day yesterday I mean seriously I, I I could have never envisioned it yeah and I mean frankly I don't think it's hyperbole at all to say without Bill Hudnut's vision and and Bob Ursay oh. I mean I, I you know downtown is not what it is and hell I don't have this job Andy doesn't have that job but thankfully it, the stealth operation with Rick Venturi a part of it uh, was executed 40 years ago today coach I do want to shift gears to present sure. day we are through certainly multiple waves of free agency so far it's largely been team run it back we'll see what happens with Julian Blackman here moving forward but Joe Flacco and Raquan Davis the only two moves 
so far yeah. outside the building for the Colts. Thoughts on how they've handled this uh, free agency and, and I guess a little bit of trade period here in the month of March as well. Well, it, you know, it's basically predictable. I mean, you know, uh, Chris is just not going to overspend in free agency. He's just not. I mean, you know, we have history now. We have, you know, we have eight years to to watch it, and he's just not going to do it. He's very frugal with the dollar, um, and he's that he, he is not going to get it. It's not like he's never done it at all, but it's been mostly in the second tier. I mean, you know, Moss was a good pickup. Minshew was a great pickup, uh, but not a lot of money. Um, you know, obviously Rivers back when we got him. I, I think probably the most, I would say, impressive and name and money guy was Gilmore. I, I think Gilmore was probably, and he was a great pickup. Uh, we let him out the door, which I wouldn't have, and I don't, I don't care what anybody says. I wouldn't let him out the door. But, uh, you know, it, it's predictable. And it's really, I guess, a preventative offseason. It's, you know, I don't know if people love that. I guess what they did, I don't know that they've gotten any better, uh, but I guess that they have prevented a slide because you had a lot of core players, a lot of core players that were, you know, up for, uh, you know, significant raises. And so the money went to those guys. So in that sense, uh, I guess you can look at it as a prevention winner, uh, you know, it's still there's still huge keys for them to getting better. And I'll be honest, with those people in Houston are serious. Now, you know, as opposed to prevention, those guys have gotten out and taken a team that was really good in December and January, you know, with two rookies of the year, and they've made it better. I mean, they have really made it better. So I, I guess you, you compare your year to – compared to what, you know, and I, I think it starts with the division. So we'll see, you know, I, as you know, as you know, Cabo, my emphasis now is draft. I spend uh, every morning at this, at this work site, um, not pleasantly, I, I look at the Gulf of Mexico coming in, <laughs> but I spend every morning several hours preparing for the draft as if I were going to make it. So, you got know, some Morse Reservoir been, All-Stars? Love it. Yeah, well, we got Morse Reservoir. I, I had to take McConkey from Georgia. He was my Morse Reservoir All-Star. Mm -hmm. But he's he, since the senior ball and since his Georgia workout, he's exploded. I can't. He's got too much visibility now. I can't <laughs> put him up there. He's in the Gulf of Mexico <laughs> All-Stars now. <laughs> That's exactly. I was just going to say that. He is, a, he is right there in Gulf of Mexico, uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico All-Star. But I'll tell you, this is the year, just generally speaking, that <clears throat> if you're in need of a receiver or an offensive lineman, uh, it, it's a big year. I mean, there if, if you're sitting in that first round, really there's no excuse not to come up, with, if you intend to, not to come up with a really quality and potentially elite receiver. Same way in the offensive line. Now, I've kind of – you know, I have a I have a list for 15. I have a key four, a critical four of guys that I would love to have in whatever order you want to take them. I know my order in my draft board, but uh, I, I just I just feel like those two positions. Now I've eliminated the offensive line in a sense because I think we're very very solid there, and we're certainly not going to invest any more there, um, and we have certain needs. And there's enough guys that are, are ranked together that you, you can not only get the best player on the board, but you can also fill a need. Coach Venturi with us here on the Payless Lakers Hotline. Well, I have to ask as a natural follow-up, who's on, who's on your board then? Who are the four guys? Okay, well, you know, and, and again, Andy, now I'm talking about um, hopefully availability sure. at 15. Sure, okay, sure. I'm not, I'm not going to get into I, – I can get into the three quarterbacks. I – you know, I, I look at it a little bit different. I love Daniels at LSU. And I know, and I'm not talking about pundits, I know guys in the league that I communicate with uh, weekly, and there are a lot of people that think Daniels is number one, and I'm not, I, I'm not sure if I had to make the decision because I just think he plays well in the structure. You know, and the more I watch Neighbors and Thomas, the more I keep looking at Daniels and say, this guy is really, really good. But – that's beside the point. The quarterback situation always is inflated, and it looks like now you're going to have four guys in the top 15. 
uh, which is good for us because, uh, you know, it's good for us because that means you're really drafting 11th, okay? If you if you feel, f- figure the quarterbacks out, then you're, you're really drafting 11th on the rest of the field. And so I, you know, when I look at our needs, I mean, I, I, and that, that kind of dictates my four, you know, I, I think, you know, first of all, I, I think it's, we really lack uh, perimeter speed on offense. We lack, we lack somebody that can break it and win outside the numbers. No disrespect to Pittman, but Pittman is a slot or tight end in the wide receiver's body. Everything he does is inside the numbers. And when you when your when your passing game is inside the numbers, it makes it easy for a defense. Now, because when you when you look at our team and you look at the two ambians on our team, it's Richardson and Taylor. All right, then our receivers are really inside guys. So, what I'm trying to tell you, without being uh, X and O geeky, is that teams are going to play the eight. They're going to they're going to uh, they're going to count nine guys inside the numbers now. It might be an eight-man front with a single high. It might be a quarters spin in the safeties. But they're going to have nine guys inside the numbers to stop those running games, the zone reads, and the inside passing game. And a lot of the same defenses that stop those zone runs and zone reads also will pack in versus inside passes. So what you have to have with this kind of offense is you have to have, if it's nine inside the numbers, you got to win the two battles outside. So to me, we have to come up with an explosive, game-changing outside guy. And then on defense, okay, first of all, we need a scheme revamp. We're 28th in points given up two years in a row, 24th. Um, if we don't have a scheme uh, change, it's not going to matter. But within that, I certainly like to get Blackman signed because I think Blackman, when healthy, is a game-changing safety. I think he's special when healthy, and I really don't want to lose him. I think that'd be a huge loss. And then, is the corner position good enough? I don't think it's as bad as it's advertised, but I still think you're playing with four or five-plus guys out there. That really bothers me. I, I'm a speed at the corner. If I ever have a, a disagreement with the Colts or, or with Chris, and it's not many. He's a really good evaluator of talent. But the only time we dare to be different or dare to disagree is I just I just believe in speed at the corner. I, I just a four or five is the cutoff for me. Anything over that I worry about. I just always have believed in coaching it and watching it for 50 years that a young corner has got to have the speed to outrun his mistakes. So all I'm doing with that is giving you kind of a wide breath. Now my four guys, if 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 I had my picks. Okay, there's two receivers that I would like to be there. Um, I think Thomas from LSU, you know, is a big outside guy that can win, that can beat the press. He's 6'4", over 205. You know, he's a 4'3 guy, 4'3'3". I mean, he can explode and go get it. Uh, He would be like bringing a fast A.J. Brown into what, what he meant to the Eagles, if you will, except this kid has a lot more speed than A.J. Brown and size and toughness. I think he's right. I think he's got a lot to go. And then my favorite player in the draft is Worthy from Texas, and most people have him down in the late part of the first round, but I I could not pass him up. I think he's electric. I know he's small at 165, but you want to talk about taking a game over, explosiveness, a return guy, and now that's even – uh, enhanced a little bit, or it's it's more attractive with the new kickoff rule. He's a punt return guy. The four two one is legitimate. It's, it's football speed. I just could never walk by Worthy. Uh, that's my editorial. And then there's a couple defensive guys. If uh, if somebody said you had, if somebody backed me in the corner and said you had to have a corner, uh, it would definitely be Quinion Mitchell, and he would stand alone for me. I think he's far superior to the rest of them. I I, I like a lot of them. Uh, I'd like to have them. Uh, But I think that Quinion Mitchell from Toledo has it all. I think he has the football ability, uh, the the profile. I think he has the metrics. He's another 4'3 kid, can really fly. 
he would be the one defensive corner that I, I would consider there. And then the one edge guy that I would consider is, of course, uh, Turner from Alabama with that great, great speed and explosiveness off the corner. So that's, you know, if you, if you put me in a corner, that's kind of my four guys that I would love to be there and to be able to, you know, to take one of them. They may all be gone. I, I don't think so, but it'll be close. And then, and then my YO card now is McConkie, the kid from Georgia. I just, I, he has just grown on everybody. He had a great senior bowl. They couldn't cover him. Then he comes to Indy, runs the 4-3-9. I, I could give you all the numbers. I mean, his short shuttle is like a record setting. It's just he's got so much speed and quickness. I think he and, and McCarthy from Michigan probably have been the biggest risers, to be honest with you, um, in, in football people's minds you know, from, you know, the end of the season to now. Again, Rick Venturi is with us. We began the conversation looking back on the 40-year anniversary today of the move from Baltimore to Indianapolis. Absolute gold from the coach on that as he was in the thick of that operation. And now we're talking a little present-day Colts as we're less than a month away from the draft. Last one for me, Coach, and again, cannot thank you enough for the time. We did see the Legereus Sneed trade happen over the weekend in the division to Tennessee for a third-round pick, I believe a, f- a flip of a seventh-round pick uh, from Tennessee and Kansas City. Is that something you would have looked into? I know maybe you – I think you just said, you know, corner maybe is not as a big of a need as you have it. Well, but thoughts on Legereus need? Oh, yeah. I would, When you say looked into it, there's no question about it. The only thing that would have been prohibitive, I mean, for a third, are you kidding me? This is a premier corner. And here's the thing. I, I, I've, I've often said there, there's several things – that I think are really important. Okay, several principles of getting a building a championship team. Number one, you must use every resource out there. It's not just about the draft. You have to be able to make trades. We made a really good one for Buckner. Uh, you have to use free agency to some degree, and you have to draft extremely well, but you have to get impact players. You have to get impact players in significant positions with those high draft points. And that's really important. High value positions who can change the game. And then I think you have to have a premium on speed outside the numbers, both offensively and defensively. I think it's a corner game. I'm different than other people. I would have, I would have battled to get sneak. Now, if the long-term cost, and I'm sure that's what stopped Chris, it's not the trade value. My God, if you want a third draft pick, are you kidding me? You stop draft picks for what? You just change oil after three years. You just keep changing fourth-round draft picks. You have to have impact guys, and Snead is one of those guys that's an impact corner. Now, the other thing, the use of resources. Now, if you – all right, let's say that I I gave you those needs. So I've got a wide receiver need outside the numbers, and I've got a corner need. Well, if it's in the draft, I can't get both guys with number 15. And I can't guarantee you that on 46, that impact, I can get a good player, but not necessarily an impact guy. So if I fill one need, let's say I fill the corner need in free agency, now I pick my wide receiver and I fill two need. You follow me, Kevin? I, I just think if, if you don't use every resource, now, you know, the, the long-term value, apparently the Colts did not want to get in for that much money. But in terms of filling needs, you bet, you know, you bet you want that corner and then you then you don't even have to worry about the corner position in the draft. Now you pack it with wide receivers or whatever you need. It just seems like, in a way, coach, they're kind of forcing a need in the draft, and I just hate that. Depending on how that board's well, going to fall, you can't fill them, Cabo. You can't. Right. That's why you cannot win with the draft exclusively. I've mm-hmm. ta- I've had great conversations with Bill Polian, and Bill told me in a sit down meeting that even the best of the best, and he's one of them, a Hall of Famer they hit at 54% of draft picks. And what I mean by hit is after the third year, that draft pick is a significant game effector, not just on your team. You follow what I'm saying? So if, if, if even the best of the best is hitting at 54%, you can't possibly, unless you have a 40-year contract, build a team exclusively from the draft. No. Without question. And honestly, if you look at the draft, it's more of an every other kind of like hit when you look at the Ballard era from whatever, 2019, um, certainly had plenty of misses in there, 2017, if you look at that core. 
as well. Coach, well, unbelievable. Particularly at corner. Particularly at corner. And, and corner, and, yes. You know, the, certainly and Quincy Wilson and Ross. We've been, he has been great on the third, on the second day and third day. But what happens is at the same time, you just change oil on those guys after a while. Yeah. Yeah. And, and corner again, finding the multi-year guy has been an issue for this team. Coach cannot thank you enough. Just outstanding stuff uh, looking back. And I'm sure honestly, some vivid memories for you and a lot of emotions stirred up today. When you think back, 40 years ago today, the move from Baltimore to Indy. Cannot wait for you to get back in town. Obviously, plenty of draft coverage coming your way. Tell uh, Miss Sher- M- M- Sherry we said hi. Give her our best. Enjoy the golf, and we'll see you up here in a few weeks, all right? Yeah, um, thank you so much. Really enjoyed. Had fun being with on you guys today. Matt and I will be on that draft come draft time on the radio, so I'm looking forward to that. Coach, enjoy Thanks, coach. the one and only Rick Venturi right there on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Again, we went down memory lane from 730 to 8, looking back on the 40-year anniversary. And, Andy, those four names that Rick Venturi really likes at 15. Yeah, again, wide receiver from LSU, Brian Thomas Jr., who I love. Xavier Worthy, who, remember, ran the, uh, what was it, the 4-1? Is that what it was at the NFL Combine? Just ridiculous. The Texas wide receiver, Quinion Mitchell, uh, the Toledo corner. He is probably, if you look at mock draft scene, as much as, I would say, I would say Quinion Mitchell's attached to the Colts on mock drafts probably more than anybody. Yeah, it's probably seven out of ten. Yeah, did something on like the website that. earlier this week, and he right. was easily the most popular. Uh, name. I would say so. And then Dallas Turner, who I who, love, who I know he ain't going to be there. Yeah, he ain't going to be there. He he's pretty consensus. He ain't getting out of the top ten. Uh, he's the Alabama edge. You know, one thing it, I didn't follow up, but it it sounded like he wanted a wide receiver. Did Coach Venturi at fifteen? It sounded like he would go wide receiver if he if you made him do the pick he would go with either Worthy or or Brian Thomas from LSU. Is, yeah. Did you get that? Did you pick yeah. up on that? Again, I don't think you know he is like DefCon on the corner need. I sure. mean, he still views it as an area where you need to improve, but doesn't look at it maybe in that light. And you know, just the ability to pass up on again a, a by all accounts a generational wide receiver draft class. I mean, those are you know paraphrasing a little bit, but Chris Ballard even said that to us back at the combine, you know, a month ago. And again, O-line and wide out, he thinks some great, great depth in this draft. But yeah, the perimeter speed, the explosive outside guy. Uh, and he said this endlessly here in the Gus Bradley era, but the defensive scheme needs a revamp. I mean, he has been adamant about that. Yeah, but that's not going to happen. For years. Do you think that's going to happen? Uh, typically, if a coach has been doing it for as long as Gus yeah. Bradley What's has, change I would up? say no on that end. Now, again, do you have challenges from Shane Steichen as a second-year head coach saying, all right, I've watched it for a year. These are my thoughts. I'm the head coach. I want you to implement some of this stuff. Maybe that's wishful thinking on my end there, but is that a conversation that Shane had with him in the offseason there? So. Uh, just great, great stuff. Corbin will get that up on the podcast. We'll we'll splice that out individually. Uh, Rick Venturi's thoughts today. Again, 40-year anniversary of the move. For those that, I guess, I don't know, want a little bit more background on it, uh, the 30 for 30 ESPN did. This is dating back years ago. The band that wouldn't die, an outstanding in-depth look at that move. Uh, so certainly check that out. As well. All right, Scott Agnes going to join us, talk Pacers in about five. We'll get into the Purdue conversation coming up in the nine o'clock hour. We teased it earlier. Again, there's a clip from Trey Kaufman Wren uh, over the weekend after their win over Utah State that I just think epitomizes so much of why Purdue has gotten to the consistent level that they have. And honestly, a huge reason why it's about the puzzle pieces on the court and off the court as much as anything. We'll play that coming up in the nine o'clock hour. It is time, though, for a morning checkdown, and it's an ugly start to the morning checkdown. The Morning Checkdown, brought to you by the National Invitation Tournament. Experience basketball's beginning with the NIT. Coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse April 2nd and 4th. Yeah, KB, you're right. Uh, Ugly one last night. Pacers losers in Chicago, 125-99. Indiana still the sixth seed right now. They have a full game ahead of the Miami Heat, but a chance to extend that lead. They didn't get it done. Now just one and three on the season against Chicago. And postgame, Rick Carlisle unhappy with the defense, but also points in the paint. They only had 12 points in the paint. At halftime, did the Pacers a crazy number. They lost points in the paint total for the game, 60 to 38. Very much unlike them. Here's Carlisle postgame. Get more stops. It's hard to keep a team out of of the paint in transition. I mean, that's a simple answer. 
But, no, listen, it, it, pain points have been hard to come by against them all year long. So this is not anything different. But in the third quarter, when we um, got some traction, it was happening because, you know, our intensity level defensively picked up and, you know, we were able to get downhill and, and get the ball in transition. So, you know, we just we got to get home, get ready for the next one. Like I said, still the sixth seed. Up next, Lakers. That's going to be tomorrow night in Cambridge. Our coverage here on The Fan beginning at 6.30. Yeah, I thought watching last night, I just really felt the loss of Benedict Matherin. That that bench unit, very poor to close out the first quarter, start the second. You just lack that offensive punch. And on a night win, I mean, look at it. Halliburton, very poor. Siakam, not his usual self that he's been lately. Aaron Neesmith, I know you're putting a lot on his plate. Yeah, 2-9 and from 3 last night. You just have to have a little bit more from him offensively. Uh, you've really missed Matherin, the guy that can be that jolt from a scoring punch, can be that microwave. Obviously, he's out for the year. You felt that last night. So, again, Lakers tomorrow at 7 o'clock. LeBron did play last night. Uh, he missed Tuesday night with an ankle injury. Um, so, we'll see if LeBron gives it a go uh, coming up tomorrow night, as certainly the Lakers need that as well. All right, it is MLB opening day. I guess weather in the Midwest, not too, too bad. I mean, not balmy by any means, but I remember there's been some flurries in the forecast. On opening day before, uh, it'll be Brewers and Mets. That'll be our first game here at 110. Uh, from a local Midwest angle, White Sox hosting the Tigers at 410. Uh, Pirates traveling down uh, to take on the Marlins. Cardinals out in L.A. A little drama for the Cardinals there uh, on opening day. They'll get the Dodgers. The Nationals and the Red Legs as they are at home as always here to open up the season. Cubs in Texas take on the Rangers. And the Guardians got a late one taking on where the hell are the A's even playing nowadays? Uh, where are the A's playing? I have no other. Are play- they still they're, in Oakland yeah, they're, they're, for another they're, year? They're, they're still there. Yeah, they're Gosh, still there. I, that I sounds did, awful. I, before the season, they canceled the fan fest because you know why would you want you don't want your people, your workers around a bunch of fans who are going to yeah, be upset. An hour of booze. Uh, yeah, but they but the fans put on their own fan fest, and there's like ten thousand people there. Ten thousand is a lot more uh, than I would have thought. It's a lot of people. Have they decided where they're going to move that? They're going to move that to Nashville, so Nashville gets yet something Vegas. else. Did I, I was in Vegas. Did I miss that? I okay. Don't know. Uh, Indianapolis Indians, they are going to be with the Louisville Bats this weekend down in Louisville. Opening day for them coming up April 2nd, taking on Memphis. That tastes like dollar beers right there. That tastes like beer bats. Triple A baseball. Dollar hot dogs. Let's Let's go. go. Uh, Games tonight, NCAA tournament. It all begins. 7-0-9 is your first tip-off on CBS. Arizona and Clemson, the 2-6 matchup there. UConn, San Diego State at 7-39. North Carolina, Alabama should be a good one at 9-39. And then the late one, like you said, get the uh, brew the coffee if you don't mind. Iowa State, Illinois, the 2-3 matchup. That's going to be on TBS uh, a little after 10 o'clock. About 10 15. You and I said this yesterday, the one game we disagree on, I'm going to go with Alabama, you're going Carolina. Yeah, I'm going to go with Carolina. Otherwise, we both have, what, Illinois, UConn, and Arizona yeah. winning tonight? I'm curious, again, is this, and maybe I'm reading too much into the Sweet 16 last year, does UConn get tested in any way, shape, or form? Sure. You know, right. Eight straight wins of double digits in the tournament. San Diego State can muck it run. up. They could muck it up. And they did maybe. it last year to Alabama. Yep. Now, again, UConn much more battle-tested battle than, I think, Alabama, such a young Alabama team last year. But no one thought, I think, on this night last year that San Diego State would do that. Uh, be curious. That's our biggest spread here of Sweet 16 weekend. Ten and a half points, that one. Um, again, we'll talk a lot more about Purdue and Gonzaga coming up here a little bit later. Uh, lastly, the IU women in Albany, New York. I can't think of a worse NCAA regional site than let's travel to Albany, New York. Isn't that where the men played last year, too? Am I imagining that? I believe so, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's women's where regional. It's where seasons go to die, sorry. you know. And, and it's kind of an <laughs> odd, like, there's only two regional sites for the women. It's either Portland or Albany uh, for the Sweet 16 Elite Eight games coming up, so... Uh, For IU, uh, they're trying to shock the world. Uh, I believe I saw that line, Andy, at 15-and-a-half. South Carolina, that is the undefeated Gamecocks of South Carolina, 34-0, taking on Terry Moran's bunch tomorrow at 5 o'clock. That doesn't seem like a lot. I mean, South Carolina is undefeated. They're the best team, like, like ever. They have six single-digit wins on the season, for what it's worth. They did just win their second-round matchup over, I, I would assume, rival North Carolina, by 47 points. Well, that's what I'm saying. If I, if I got 86-70, I'd get the cover. 
Uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's, if it's 15 if it's, and a half, right? It, well, no, I'm, say, oh, I'm, saying, saying, South I'm Carolina saying South Carolina. Carolina. I'm gotcha. And this is nothing against the IU women, but it, it feels like. I say the IU women <laughs> cover. <laughs> okay, I'll Should go. Should we go six I, pack I, on this? I'll go. You giving me 15 and a half? Yeah. Can yeah. we shake on yeah, it? Yeah, there we go. Can We're the gonna, YouTube stream you pick this up? There's a shake. A shaking of the hand. You see that, Corbin? Dykton. Well, over he, my Indiana well, State win. Right now, Come he's on. you know visiting what he's doing the tour down there, the international where is tour. He? Is, in he in, is he in New Orleans or is he in oh, Florida? I forgot where he is said he? he was doing the second bachelor party in New Orleans. Oh goodness! Can you imagine? Yeah, honey, uh, no, my, my brother wants to have two bachelor parties. <laughs> Oh, sure. Go right ahead. <laughs> I, I know Vegas a guy, and then Miami. I, I know a guy, a couple we know. I know we got to take a break that he, he went on a bachelor party, some exotic place. like It was like, you know, Cancun or someplace like that, like a party place. And I remember, I remember his wife was like, again, because this guy had been married <laughs> four times. This was his fourth round of bachelor parties. <laughs> It's a guy well into his 40s. Uh, and, well, that's probably that precursor of behavior is probably why uh, he's oh, running goodness. it back for a fourth time. Scott Agnes talking Pacers next. Go to 1075thefan.com and register to win Golden Gloves.
Boy, I tell you, the last hour has been fun. Uh, we just had Coach Rich, uh, Rick Venturi on for the last hour or so. If you missed any of Coach, again, in 730, we talked a lot about the 40-year anniversary of the Colts ending up from Baltimore right here in Indianapolis. And then the last 25 minutes or so, uh, just uh, nerding out over NFL draft, uh, what he thinks Chris Ballard has done well, what they still need, and everything in between. So Corbin will have that up on the Podcast Center, 1075thefan.com, or wherever you down uh, load your podcast. Some really, really good stuff there uh, from Coach Van Cherry. But let's keep it going. Uh, Pacers last night, we talked about it to begin the show. The, you heard it there in the check down. Not a good last night, not a good game last night for the Pacers, 125-99. Your final there in Chicago. Scott Agnes joins us. Fieldhouse Files. Scott, uh, why do the Pacers stink against the Bulls? A- any reason? One in three this season. And boy, this one, just the timing of this loss really stinks. And who knows? In the next couple of weeks, we may look back and say, if they just were two and two against the Bulls, that may have went uh, quite, a, quite a long ways there in the Eastern Conference. So a good morning. Why one in three this season against Chicago, you think? Yeah, good morning, and I'll start with the reason number one, and it's DeMar DeRozan. He's been tremendous against the Pacers all season, uh, but especially two games ago, not last night, um, as much. He wasn't needed, or he would have went for 30 if he wasn't taken out with four minutes left. But they would have been 2-2 two and two if they slowed him and the Bulls down a little bit a couple games ago. Didn't allow that buzzer beater, 46 points in overtime. For whatever reason, he's one of those that just goes off against the Pacers uh, every single game. And then beyond that, Andy, I'd go to the fact of the way in which the the Bulls play. They're tough. They're physical. Um, they're, they haven't made excuses for guys, especially like Zach Levine and LaMelo Ball being out for the majority of the season. Uh, the Pacers are the number one team at getting inside the paint. The Bulls are number one at taking that away. And uh, the defensive side of things proved to be the one that mattered more last night, I thought. He is Scott Agnes. Again, uh, Fieldhouse Files, where you can find Scott's work. Scott, there's an element of like, all right, we're 74 games into this. Yeah. It, it's almost like, okay, last night there's a level of embarrassment anytime you lose by 26, especially to a team that's likely heading to the lottery. Again, I think there are some built-in reasons why that happens. Certainly uh, the final game on a road trip isn't ideal, still doesn't offer the – 26 point excuse but I bring that up to say like at this point I think we kind of know what the Pacers are they are a team that can certainly win whatever two of three and have some moments where you think back to the end season tournament but then there's some inconsistencies there that it's probably a reason why they won't host a first round playoff series and the win total is not going to be above whatever 46 47 wins I guess and I mean every team should probably have this you know come April but like I think we finally got to a point where we kind of know who the Pacers are it's frustrating because they have so many great wins but there's still a level of inconsistency that is going to keep them I think away from hosting that first round playoff series yeah you're exactly right that's the thing that's kind of been a theme of this season is is that inconsistency um I go back to what Nate McMillan I used to joke with him about because it was kind of annoying he'd bring it up all the time but Man, I keep thinking about it every single game, KB, and he's like, hey, we got to play 48 minutes. It's a 48-minute game. Like, how many times do they consistently uh, play slowly out of the gate? We see uh, trail after one, and then it's just, you know, uphill climb ever since. And so, like, last night in that game, they got it uh, incredibly back down to seven there, four minutes left, third quarter, a tremendous start to that third quarter, which has been their best on the season. Uh, but then it just, again, felt like they were – uh, running on empty that they run it ran out of steam and that bench how much have we talked about that bench being tremendous and productive all season long well it really wasn't as much last night no. outside of tj mcconnell that's where you need them to help pick it up a little bit but uh, yeah the inconsistency has has made what could have been a 50 win season uh now you know probably more like 44 45 wins here with eight games left you really want to maximize what you do here with five of eight at home uh, and several against you know the poor teams, but it all goes back to that that one word inconsistency. The Bulls, while they're not an awful team, they're one of those that you really want to make a statement uh, uh, against and, and handle your business and, and move on. Um, and I keep going back, KB, earlier in the season, right? Two losses uh, you have to the Portland Trail Blazers, two losses to um, the Charlotte Hornets, one to the Wizards. 
there's five right there that would already make you, you know, right there in contention for four and five, uh, if not in the league right there, just because you didn't handle your business against lesser teams. He is Scott Agnes. Pacers go three and two on this road trip. It'll be the Lakers. LeBron did play last night for those going to be in the building tomorrow night. So a good sign for LeBron's availability as Pacers and Lakers. First time this season from Gamebridge Fieldhouse coming up tomorrow night. Scott Tyrese Halliburton's road trip uh, certainly better than he had been this month. I know it ended with quite a dud last night after hitting those first two threes. I think, though, again, not massive steps forward, but certainly some positive signs from him uh, on that road trip based off how he looked throughout the better part of March. Yeah, I thought so as well. The fact that he, he barely could find the basket, right, for the last month it felt like shooting 17% from three-point range, several games, you know, one of nine, one of nine. Well, now it's, it's it's better than that, back up to 43% during that road trip, much improved. But still, I, I don't know what it is. He's still just – I don't know if it's the injury or what or just the guys running on fumes right now, but still doesn't have quite – I thought the explosion, he still hasn't been that dominant kind of the all-star level guard. And maybe part of that is uh, opponents and defenses honing in on him, knowing that uh, they, they've seen the, the Lakers play the Pacers. And by removing Tyrese from the equation, it significantly takes away what the Pacers are able to produce and, and do and get into the flow of things. Because, you know, the, the games Tyrese is getting all those assists early, setting up teammates, and he settles in. Then he looks for his shot even more. That formula we haven't seen very often, I don't think, anytime soon. Um, so that, too, is part of it and the fact that opponents, hey, they have all the tape and have been able to see uh, where the Pacers are at. But it was a positive to see him him knock down more shots. It was good to see Ben Matherin back around the team. And it was also good to see Miles Turner get the blocks record put that behind him, be celebrated a little bit. Um, so there were some positives to come from the trip. Scott Agnes joining us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Fieldhouse Files as we talk uh, about the Pacers. Losers last night in Chicago. Lakers coming up tomorrow, 7 o'clock. You can hear it 6.30 right here on the fan. Uh, kind of a loaded question. Do you think they end up being the sixth seed. There's about a 48% chance. They had the best percentage to be the sixth seed. And then on top of that, boy, uh, Scott, there's been a lot of shuffling in the Eastern Conference. I mean, Cleveland has now dropped down to the four. The Knicks have ascended to the three. Who would you, if you had to choose, and again, you don't get to choose, Scott, uh, what do you think is the best matchup? I personally would rather face Cleveland or, and, and Orlando more so than the Knicks, but that's just me. How do you see the final couple weeks shaking out here, do you think? Yeah, well, the Pacers, the door is there with a lighter schedule with five of eight at home. Uh, last night, in the last couple games, it seems like nobody in that middle cluster of the Eastern Conference has wanted to win, right? Right. Uh, four through six, through the seeds four through eight have all lost their last game, including, uh, you know, all those key ones, including the Pacers last night. The Pacers really could have helped distance themselves a little bit more by getting that win last night, but that wasn't the case. And then I think realistically, yeah, they do finish in that sixth seed. Um, Miami's really reeling. That, that's the team that has been bizarre. It feels like they've lost like 13 of 15 games. Like it's troubling. Philadelphia hadn't found their groove yet. We're all waiting to see, you know, will Embiid return? Um, when, and if he does win, what will that look like? Uh, but let's say they finish in that sixth seed, which I think they should, but um, we'll see if they handle their business. I think – no question the the best, most favorable matchup for them uh, in that area would be a 3-6 matchup, uh, you know, right with against the Cleveland Cavaliers for a number of reasons, mostly because the Cavaliers have been hurt. Uh, they've been inconsistent here as of late. Uh, Pacers have had success against them both early in the season and late. Uh, that's a team that I'm not sure you know even exactly what you're going to get, and that's probably a good thing right now versus the Knicks. If they have OG and Anobi, um, they've been incredible with him. I think they've won like 17 of 20 games with OG in the lineup. The trouble is he's been out of the lineup. But that's that's a totally different game, and that, that's about physicality and toughness. Uh, and then the Magic, that's a bad matchup, I think, as well uh, because of the size and length. How many times have we talked about that with opponents, right, with the Toronto Raptors, with New Orleans, and other teams? 
um, the size issue with the Magic has given the Pacers fits. Now, the Magic have the inexperience factor, much like the Pacers, uh, but I think right now I would go uh, and want to see Cleveland if I'm the Pacers. Yeah, I would rank it probably in a very similar order, Scott, and it might be premature to look ahead to the uh, to that potential, <laughs> right. but still, if we're going to, I would rank that as you'd rather play, I think, Cleveland, or uh, probably Orlando, Cleveland, and then New York, which is actually the reverse of what that looks like right now in the standings. Again, Scott Agnes, Fieldhouse Files with us here on the Payless Stickers Hotline. Scott, last one for me. I know you wrote on this about a week ago when Miles Turner set the franchise record for blocks his relationship with Jermaine O'Neal is is there much of one I know there are some you know Texas ties there yeah there are right the the most notable thing I think being one that Jermaine was back here in Indy for the all-star weekend so they interacted I think briefly then and then Miles Turner holds a free youth basketball camp each summer back in uh, Texas and last year was at his at Jermaine O'Neal's Drive Nation Sports Facility, which is out by the airport, which is dead where Miles' dad used to work uh, before he kind of retired there. But I don't think there's anything more than like acknowledging each other uh, and briefly talking whenever they kind of see each other. It's not like they've worked out. It's not like JOs around the team very often or anything like that. Um, but that had to be a special moment. And the fact that uh, I, I thought it was cool the Pacers got J.O. to voice kind of that video to celebrate Miles when it happened. Uh, that was another way to engage with one of their former greats, right? Like some would make the case maybe he, his number should re- be retired and up in the rafters um, just because of his consistency, his all-star level uh, performance. He finished, what, second in MVP voting, I think it was, one year. Um, I don't. I think the the praise and attention and uh, and such has really gotten lost for some of those guys in those early 2000s, even late 2000s. I think Jermaine O'Neal. I think Danny Granger uh, right away. Um, so it was cool to see when a record like that's broken. You not only celebrate the the current, but the the individual who whose record is going out the door a little bit. And so it was nice to have Jermaine O'Neal's name in the conversation the last week because of it. Yeah, I'd say maybe dating back the last six months and the All Star Game plays into this, Scott. It's been nice to see more public acknowledgement, recognition, have everyone to describe it for Jermaine O'Neal because I thought certainly he's mm-hmm. one of the best players in Pacers NBA history uh, and deserves that notoriety. Uh, certainly on that end. So uh, Scott Agnes, Fieldhouse Files, two weeks to go in the regular season, and we'll see if the Pacers with eight to go can continue to hold on to one of those top six spots in the postseason. Scott, great stuff, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Scott Agnes, Payless Liquors Hotline. On the other side, we have not had the chance to hit on it yet today. Did Josh Schertz really tell <laughs> Louisville <Yeah>. no? No. <laughs> With the contract reportedly 10 times the amount he's making at Indiana State. We'll hit on that and some Purdue conversation. I thought there was a clip after their win on Sunday over Utah State that kind of epitomizes why Matt Painter has built such a successful program in his time. And it came from a player, a player that you probably wouldn't think would make such a comment like that. We'll hit on that in the 9 o'clock hour. It is the wake up call here, 93 5, 107 5, the fan. You love spring and in Indy, but. You-
thank you to Evan and um, the great people at Cluster Truck. We're eating during the break, stuffing our faces. Again, ClusterTruck.com or download the app. Uh, They got all sorts of great deals there delivering all over Indianapolis. Again, use the fan as a promo code. Get 25% off your next order of $25 or more. Let's go around the room. Where did you get, KB? Shout out to Fred on the delivery. I went with the Lazy Burrito, one of their go-tos. So that is the fan, right, on the promo code. The fan, 25% off your next order of $25 or more. I have the Crispy Chicken Caesar Wrap. What did you have over there, Corbin? I got the tachos. Ah, opening day nachos. There you go. A little spin on it. Look at that. A little opening day flavors. Like Corbin rocks his Braves gear. We yeah, teased it first before, place Braves yeah. before the break. Uh, and the Pat Kelsey to Louisville. Yeah. And the reports that I find interesting come locally at, from Terre Haute and nationally. Matt Norlander from CBS Sports is yep. the one that I saw in that Josh Schertz turned down Louisville. The report from Terre Haute, Rick Semler, uh, one of their TV people out there, reportedly said that that was a five-year deal of three million annually. By all reports, Josh Schertz is making a little over three hundred thousand at Terre Haute or in Terre Haute. You're telling me he turned down a deal? Well, ten plus, times that amount. Yeah, plus it's a top, you know. 10, 12, 15 job in the country, even though it's been down for a number of years. Uh, here's what I'm interested in. So, Pat Kelsey gets the Louisville job, and now Pat Josh Kelsey's Schertz. crazy, by the way. Uh, he seems that way. And now Josh Schertz, it opens it up to where he is going to go to St. Louis. Here is the context that I wonder about. Number one, let me go back for a second. The Louisville search has been an abject disaster for the most part. They had a year, year and a half where they knew that they're going to have to get a new coach, and they ended up with their ninth choice, whatever. Pat Kelsey may work out, but uh, kind of a debacle there, drama, PR disaster, which you didn't need. The thing that I don't know with Josh Schertz, because I do not – I'm going to be clear. I do not believe he flat turned down Louisville. I believe – and the thought process was this, KB – there was a, uh, uh, a a memo of understanding between Schertz and St. Louis that was signed or agreed upon, you know, over a week ago. And so was Schertz going to go back on his word? And then number two, what I had heard from U of L people is because of this memo of understanding, there was a financial component as well. And did Louisville want to buy him out of that? These are the things that I don't know that add context. I would be stunned if he just straight turned them down to become the next head coach at St. Louis or if he was kind of bound because he thought his good friend Dusty May or, quite frankly, somebody else was going to take the U of L job. You wonder if Schertz committed himself too early in the process to St. Louis and then Louisville, who financially, because the ACC is not the SEC or the Big Ten, and they've been buying out ADs and uh, and coaches and coaching staffs the last several years. They're paying on a bunch of guys that if they didn't have the money, right, to go get Josh Schertz if they really wanted him, or maybe U of L thought, hey, there's not that much of a difference between Pat Kelsey and Josh Schertz. So it's definitely interesting. Uh, and Indiana State, by the way, Going to be playing who? Utah coming up on yeah, Tuesday there. Uh, Tuesday at Hinkle. In, I, in the NIT. But if he flat out turned them down, I, that to me would be stunning. That's still a top 15 job in the country. I, and, and, of course, the legal manners. And, again, what he told St. Louis. And is there anything behind the scenes there that was agreed to financially that could impact it? I think the point you make, though, is great about you're telling me Louisville's thought about this for a year and this is the results of the search. Like, in a way, I kind of felt that way about the Colts post Chuck Pagano. I mean, Chris Ballard knew he was firing Chuck Pagano sure. after that first year. You vet Josh McDaniels to the nth, 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 nth degree. You, and can't, make be, sure you can't be embarrassed like that. That he is going to take the job or whoever. Right. You know, you that, that's all you're thinking about in year one there. Um, and, I mean, hell, Louisville, if they would have fired Kenny Payne in December, I don't think we're here. You know, you would have gotten a head start on. At that point, it didn't look like Michigan was 1,000% going to be open. Certainly didn't look like Ohio State sure. was going to be open. And just the dominoes that naturally fall off of all of that. On the other side, more on the Boilermakers of Purdue, their Sweet 16 matchup, and why they are at the point they are from a program standpoint. We'll look at the uh, NCAA tournament bracket-wise and the Boilers next. Basketball wasn't born.
All right, 9 o'clock hour, broadcasting live from the drivehuber.com studios. KB and Andy hanging out with you. Another hour to go if you missed any of today's show. Boy, it's been a heater today. Scott Agnes joined us last segment, and Coach Venturi joined us uh, in the 7.30 and 8 o'clock segments to talk about the 40-year anniversary there uh, of the Colts, Baltimore to Indianapolis. Boy, uh, that historic time, and he talked some free agency, some draft prep, uh, as well. So you miss any of those, 1075thefan.com, the podcast center, or wherever you download your podcast. I will I will say this. Venturi talked about this, KB. I would love to do, uh, and this might be a video component we could put on the website. He, he would not want to do this, uh, is I would love to watch Coach watch film on all of these different college prospects that are coming out. I, wide receiver, corner, lineman, doesn't matter. I would love to watch and to sit how he sits every morning. He said there in Florida uh, and watch uh, him break down film of these guys. I would love to nerd out over well, that. I believe at one point he was doing it with Gruden down there. Him and John Gruden oh, was he would really? get together each morning, oh. and they would I break like down film together, yes, to be a fly on the wall and listen to those two there. Uh, that was one of my favorite interviews we've honestly done, Coach Venturi, uh, back in that 7.30 segment, and then also in the 8 o'clock segment. So for those who missed it, again, Corbin will have that up on the podcast, our podcast page, 1075thefan.com, your one-stop shop there. But a little bit of history on the 40-year anniversary today, or maybe tonight, the wee hours of the morning, of the move from Baltimore to Indy, and then some present-day questions on his thoughts on the Colts offseason and the draft. He labeled four guys he likes at number 15 for the Colts, so you can check that out again on our podcast page. All right, Andy, I want to get into a little Purdue talk. We're going to have Brian Newbert uh, from Golden Black join us at 930. But, you know, after that game on Sunday, you know, certainly one of the heroes of that game, particularly early on, and I think we forget, you know, grambling a little bit, but Utah State especially, I mean, that was a game for the first 10 minutes. I mean, I'm watching that. I'm like, okay, Braden Smith's got two fouls. Like, Utah State's hanging in there. But Trey Kaufman-Wren, when, you know, Purdue had some early, like, you know, they were missing some free throws. Braden Smith, I think, had a missed layup. Edie, you know, just missed a, missed a bunny. Like, to get them going, get them into the game, it was Trey Kaufman-Wren, who I thought had played very poorly uh, in the first half on Friday night. He had responded well. And, you know, the, the Kaufman-Wren-Purdue experience is an interesting one. For those unfamiliar with his background, he hails from Silver Creek down in your neck of the woods. Um, I mean, it's not often Purdue goes down in the old 8-1-2 and gets somebody out of there. Certainly Indiana and Louisville have some strong ties to those regions. Um, he was, a, by all accounts, a consensus top 50 recruit, borderline five-star. Uh, it's very rare in this state. I think Greg Oden was the last one to be a Gatorade uh, state player of the year as a junior. He was that. Um, so, again, a very highly ranked recruit, one of the highest ranked recruits, certainly in the Matt Painter era. And his career at Purdue, I don't think, has lived up to what you would expect, you know, from the four or five star sort of rank. And it's understandably, of course, he's played behind Zach Eady because he is more of a of a post guy. And he was asked post game on Sunday just about his own, you know, path at Purdue and his acceptance of the role that he has now carved out for them and I thought his answer just pretty much summarized why Purdue has had the success that they've had because not only do I feel like they get the right puzzle pieces on the floor but Andy to me Matt Painter explains to his guys this is the role we need are you going to buy in and more often than not those guys say yes and in today's world of college basketball it's pretty easy to say no and move on elsewhere again here was Trey Kaufman Wren on Sunday afternoon when asked about his career so far at Purdue? I don't think it was too difficult. I mean, I was looking at, uh, like, last year um, at this time, like, we had such a good team, you know, and where was I going to find a role to help this team win? And that's what I thought about, like, a lot during the offseason, how I can just help the team win and improve. You know, I'm just lucky to, you know, we had such a good team last year that I even found the role on this team. So I'm just appreciative of that. And, um, you know, the guys believe in me, coach believe in me, and um, for the success we've had so far. Andy, he talks like a walk-on, <laughs> you know? And, and I don't say that in a derogatory no, way. No, yeah, I it's understand. It's such an acceptance of I'll be the fifth starter, and I know 
for large chunks of the season, Mason Gillis is really sure. the fifth well, starter. I mean, Kaufman Wren's come out like three, four minutes. In the, he's come out before the first TV timeout in a number of games. And in the second half especially, it seems like Painter sure. loves to roll with Gillis there down the stretch. And, you know, whether it's Caleb First or whether it's, you know, Trey Kaufman Wren, these are guys that, again, very accomplished high school AAU, highly ranked recruits. They easily could have said, hey, you know, if you're Trey Kaufman rent, no, transfer to Cincinnati. Sure. You know, wh- whatever. Transfer to, you know, Evansville. Somewhere to get more of an expanded role. I mean, when Zach Eady goes pro or d- decides to come back last year, I mean, 90% of guys in his situation probably do transfer because they don't want to play second fiddle, sit on the bench, um, you know, not have that sort of role. And so for, like, him to accept it and then, you know, have that answer, that is just so critical to, again, making sure that the puzzle works on the floor, but it also works off the floor. So Trey Kaufman Wren doesn't go back to the apartment and says to his roommate, man, that's BS that I, that Mason's playing over me late in these games. Um, it, it, it's just such, I think, a great example of why Purdue has been able to create the culture they have had under Matt Painter because not only are they getting the right pieces on the floor, but they're getting guys that can also accept it off the floor and that's much easier said than done. Yeah, so for the so me and my wife have been together I don't know how many years, 12, 13 years, whatever it is, and her parents don't my in-laws they don't care much at all about any of the sporting things that are going on, okay? Other than do they affect me, you know, do I have to watch a game or whatever it is. But they were obsessed when, you know, because they're right there near Silver Creek High School in, South, in the 812, as you would say, they they cared when, um, oh, oh, help me, the uh, Romeo Langford, when Romeo Langford went to Indiana, they watched a bunch of games, and then they watched all the Purdue games because of Kaufman Red, uh, because he went uh, to Purdue. And it's funny, I saw him a ton, a ton in high school, and I didn't know because he, you know, the competition, you know, Silver Creek wasn't playing indie schools, right? It wasn't like that, that he was in 4A or whatever it was. So I didn't know how he would totally translate. I thought he was a little bit of a tweener. He wasn't a dominant post guy, but he also wasn't knocking down yeah, threes. Agreed. I was like, wait, is he a wing Ex- or is exactly. he a post Exactly. So, yeah. you know, watching him in high school, and, and honestly, when he committed to Purdue, and I don't mean this against some of the other schools, Indiana also offered him, L offered him, you know, Virginia was on there. I, I was, I remember talking a little bit on the air, like, he should go to Purdue or Virginia because those are the two places where you go and you buy into, hey, I might sit an entire year, right? I might sit and kind of learn uh, essentially a red shirt, or I might not play much for a year, year and a half or so. And that's kind of what has happened to him. Now, I didn't know his personality that he would buy in, but I think probably if I'm a Purdue fan, don't you feel like, Matt Painter's greatest strength is this kind of stuff. I remember when Painter came on with us. When was that? Was that before the right season? Be- no, right. it was right before the Arizona oh, game. Okay, remember? Per- perfect, yeah. perfect. Yeah, like I finals week for yeah, Purdue. Like finals it was kind of a quiet week. week. And I remember, you know, we had him on for like 20 minutes, okay? And I remember one thing that he said. He said this at other press conference. I think he mentioned it once earlier with JMV as well. Is that Matt Painter doesn't put up with BS and those types of personalities when he recruits a kid. Well, and, and I, I will add this, and I think he said it to us. He learned from making those mistakes. Sure. At one point, sure. He, and I'm not going to name any names, but I think we all can yeah. look back it, on these Purdue yeah. teams. He had a couple kids, and, right. And, and, and realize who those are. Like, he learned from that, and it, it's so much easier said than done. No, it's, I think it's... Especially a, in today's I, age of the instant gratification and social media and the transfer portal and... You know, everyone telling you, no, 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 you're not getting the opportunity you deserve. And, like, again, I just look at three guys. Caleb First. Caleb First and Trey Kaufman Wren probably more than any because, again, they were the highly ranked recruits. But even throw in, like, Mason Gillis of, you know, could he go to Ball State and average 13 a game? Probably. Could he go to Wright State? I mean, like, he just looks like a Mac player to me that would, you know, have more of a, you know, a point productive career than he's having here. Like, that is just so critical to building and sustaining as a program. When the four-star guys, to use the recruiting, when they stay and grow and develop, when Trey Kaufman Wren starts averaging 13-9, and nine, night in and night out next season, like, there's going to be Big Ten fans be like, where'd this dude come from? You know, <laughs> and, 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 like, why is he a junior that has stayed at it 
and accepted a, a, a smaller role, and then boom, Edie goes pro, and with a bunch of guards and wings, Purdue will look a lot different next year. Here's Trey Kaufman-Wren being a nice Big Ten player to round out his career. Let, let me go a step further. I think now, I think it was always difficult. I think some of this that Matt Painter is able to do, and I use Tony Bennett as you know at Virginia as the other example. And by the way, right now they're in trouble, and Purdue obviously is the one seed in the Sweet 16 with a chance to go to Phoenix in the Final Four. I actually, KB, think it's the most difficult thing. It's not even just recruiting. It's not even X's and O's and game plan and winning in the Big Ten and dealing with the media and dealing with, you know, gambling now is is is, is obviously a big story, whether it be college or pro sports. Like, to me, the most difficult thing is Matt Painter gets buy-in from guys, some of them highly ranked, maybe some of them not as highly ranked as as Kaufman Wren, and and to buy into his system that it may take a little bit of time in all in all of that. It is to me, I almost feel like it's downright impossible how he pulls that. I hate to say culture, but, you know, but that type of aura. But it around, is the right it, word, it, it is really. The, it is the I right mean, word. It's just a buzzword that everyone uses. Right. But that this kid doesn't feel disenfranchised or cast aside. Now, part of it is, hey, they're winning, so it's fun to be on a winning team. The other part is, you know, Zach Eady is the post player. <laughs> when you have the guy, you know, and maybe next year uh, that is different. I'm interested in how his game continues to grow. You know, does he become, for instance, a better shooter, a better free throw shooter, uh, more consistent? But, you know, for this team, you need different parts. And we talked yesterday to the custodian or the janitor, Brian Cardinal. You know, Kaufman Wren being able to do some of the dirty work next to Zach Eady is so pivotal and you know there are going to be games where in the NCAA tournament you need different guys to do different things we talked about Lance Jones at some point you're going to need Jones to be a little YOLO you might be down six with four minutes to go and Jones has a couple of those YOLO threes and he makes them and you win a game against you know Creighton to go to the final four and you know you saw against Utah State foul trouble Zach Eady misses a bunny and suddenly it's Kaufman Wren grabbing rebounds getting some and ones getting back to back was it not and ones uh, he is you know he's it, it's it's when he committed I remember saying I could see him being a Purdue player does that make sense? If he would have went to Indiana, and this is not to pick on Indiana, I could pick on Louisville or a number of these other schools that were in the area that offered him. I think the pressure would have been, well, why is this guy's a four or five star? He's a bust. Why is he averaging nine points a game? That's not that's not the narrative at Purdue. And I don't know how Matt Painter has accomplished that. I really don't. Sure. And, and again, obviously it helps when you got a two time well, Naismith player here it, playing it does. L- largely playing ahead of him. But still, I mean, there's a level of an acceptance there um, that you just don't always see and and really don't see very often at all. We'll talk certainly a ton more about Purdue and Gonzaga coming up tomorrow. Again, Gonzaga has made a switch in their starting lineup. They actually are one of the bigger starting front lines Purdue's going to see all year. They go 6'8", 6'8", 6'10", across their starting front line. I, I do think Purdue will take care of business tomorrow night. Uh, largely because Gonzaga needs Graham, E.K., and Aaron Watson. They're two traditional bigs. They need them to score. Like, those are their two leading scores. They're the two most consistent guys for them. And, again, I think Purdue will neutralize that. Uh, I know we won't preview the Elite Eight game, but, like, that's the one I'm really curious about. I know. You know Me Dal- too. Dalton Connect and Baylor Shireman are two of the best scoring wings in all of college basketball. And again, in the Big Ten, you just, yeah, I guess a little bit of Terrence Shannon. Of course, Purdue only saw him once this season. But again, you don't really see that aspect to it. Um, that is a question that I have of, again, you know, how do you go about guarding that guy? You know, at times it was Cam Heidi against Terrence Shannon. So does Purdue, you know, do some things where they go to their bench uh, if and when that matchup does occur coming up on Sunday? But yeah, Ben Gregg is the guy that Gonzaga's thrown in their starting lineup. He's a stretch four at 6'10. Uh, back when Purdue played them in Maui, Gonzaga went a little bit more guard-oriented uh, in the backcourt there. So that has been the switch they've had. And, again, a, one of the most efficient teams in the entire month of March here 
has been Gonzaga. Five and a half point spread for tomorrow night. Purdue favored over the Zags. Yeah, I'm surprised. And by the way, that opened at four and a half. We talked about that earlier in the week. That that number went up like immediately. It went from four and a half to five and a half. So some money came in immediately on that. I am surprised. And listen, these numbers ultimately, the ball gets tipped and we start playing basketball. Who knows how much they mean? I just I look at ESPN's matchup predictor. I mean, Purdue has a 77.4% chance of winning on Friday night. That seems rather high. Just to say that in the NCAA tournament seems rather high. 77% uh, percent chance. And you're right. You win on Friday. That elite game, that elite eight game, that's where like all the angst is in the NCAA tournament, is it not? How, how those, does, that day and a half between those games? I was going to ask you this. How do you think like Purdue fan emotion? Oh, God. Is this thursday into friday than it was last friday and i guess i'll give you my answer first i think like last friday it's like oh my gosh we have the thousand pound piano but there's no way we're gonna lose like no i mean no i mean it's it's scrambling like there's no way we're actually gonna lose that game and i still think that element is there with utah state agreed Um, agreed now it's like you it's maybe not as mental now it's just like damn here we go i mean this is we are playing flat out dude it, it it you know, is it more physical than it is mental, I guess, if you want to look at it from a week. But, yeah, I am curious just, like, how the emotions now change of you were in that, you know, celebrating mood Monday, Tuesday, and now it quickly transitions into, all right, here we go. This is it. I mean, this is what you dream to be in the second weekend and a chance to go the Elite Eight. Now you got it. Yeah, I kind of feel like last weekend we were able to say, well, you know, they, they want to get the monkey off their back and everything else last weekend because we knew – that they were going to win, right? Didn't didn't it feel like we always had that? I mean, if you're a Purdue fan, you had that in your back pocket. You knew you were winning against Grambling State, and you had a you had pretty high confidence. I would say very very high confidence that you were going to win the the round of 32 game. Now, I didn't think it would be snatching the soul of uh, whoever you played. In this case, it was Utah State, but I felt like we. We put lofty expectations on Purdue last week, and it was very easy for us to do so because you you really had, and I know, listen, the past is the past, but you really had a good feeling they were going to move on uh, to the next rounds in Detroit. I kind of feel like, and I know this is bashing Utah State in the 8-9 game, I kind of feel like for Purdue, this is where the basketball starts. Now, saying that, I feel like Purdue fans are pretty confident against Gonzaga. I think the Elite Eight game is always a toss-up, and Creighton is uh, a beast, and we know Tennessee, uh, even though you beat them, again, uh, is a very good team. Again, I think it's going to be Creighton. I think that will be the matchup to go the Final Four, but I even feel like there's uh, there is a pretty wide optimism going into this Gonzaga game. Well, and again, let's just call a spade a spade here. Dante Jackson, at some point after that playing game, is leaving the film room to talk to IUPUI about their opening. Uh, Danny Sprinkle is leaving the film room over the weekend to talk to Washington about their opening. Uh, And, you know, (laughs) Mark Few ain't doing that. Mark Few obviously is staying at Gonzaga and same thing with, you know, Greg McDermott and uh, and Rick Barnes as well. So cannot wait for this weekend for the Boilers. Again, Purdue and Arizona, our national title pick still intact there. We'll see if we get that rematch coming up here. Uh, a week from Monday. Just quickly, you know, we haven't talked too much. We've done a lot of the Thursday games today. Are we the same? So we both have Purdue on Friday. Uh, do you have Marquette finally ending the NC State? Yeah, I went chalk up there. I had Houston and Marquette in that Elite Eight. I do think the Duke-Houston game is outstanding. I mean, just on many levels. Uh, I love, like, Kelvin Sampson against Duke. I, I don't know. For some reason, I just love that aspect to it. I mean, Creighton, Tennessee should be just an absolute heavyweight battle. Uh, I I had Creighton at the start of the tournament. I believe you did as well. Um, So, yeah, I have that Elite Eight for me on the right side of your bracket is Houston, Marquette, and then Purdue, Creighton. Yeah, I think Detroit's going to be full. What's that Creighton spread, by the way? Uh, It is Tennessee by two and a half. Uh, And what's the Duke, Houston? Uh, Duke, Houston is four and a half. Houston by about four and a half. Boy. I know. Four and a half to Duke. Interesting. I know. I don't know. I, I got to be honest. I don't know what to do with Houston Duke. I, I think that would be one. I may just watch and have fun watching, and maybe I don't financially have anything at stake. In all my brackets, I had Houston 
being there in the Elite Eight and obviously moving on past whoever they played. I, I, I think I had Duke losing. Who did Duke play? Vermont, remember? Vermont was the sexy. Yeah, th- Corbin, was, you remember that? They're the sexy uh, 13 uh, seed uh, that we I, all that took. That was one of my upsets. The I Catamounts. Missed. Two of five on my first round upsets there. <laughs> Thank you to Oakland. You were, you were lucky you were that good, <laughs> Thank by you, the Mr. Way. Campy, for that one. All right, uh, coming up in a few again, Brian Newbert, who's up in Detroit. I get things started there from a coverage standpoint. We'll talk Boilers with him. It was the worst offensive night of the year for the Indiana Pacers. We'll lead off the check down with that. The Morning Checkdown, brought to you by the Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament. Elevate the game at the inaugural WBIT, coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse, April 1st and 3rd. Yeah, let's get it popping for your morning check down. 125.99. That's your final last night. Pacers losers in Chicago. Just 43 points at halftime. A season low. Just 12 points in the paint at halftime, which is absolutely unbelievable. Post game, Tyrese Halliburton, eight games left. He knows what's at stake. We got eight games left. So, you know, I think that for us to get to where we want to get to, you know, we got to take care of these games the right way. You know, obviously, everybody knows where the standings are right now, how close it is, and how every game matters right now so it's obviously frustrating I think for us as a group but you know I think that you know we can't dwindle on it like got to learn from it watch the film learn from it and be ready to go at home against the Lakers Pacers will end the regular season out just one in three against the Bulls next up for the Pacers hosting the Lakers that's tomorrow night seven o'clock tip off our coverage here on the fan at 6 30. I've not said this often about the Pacers lately I thought their bench was very bad last night I think you felt the absence of Benedict Mather and you just needed some scoring jolts at different parts of the game you didn't have that there and really your big three scores if you look at it Halliburton Siakam and I think you throw Aaron Neesmith as that third guy Andy, 8 of 33 from the field. You, you, you just cannot have that. Again, lowest point total of the year. Doug McDermott hit a three with, like, 30 seconds to go, and that, <laughs> yeah. like, took it away from being, like, the second worst loss of the year to, like, the fifth. So <laughs> shout out to I Doug McDermott that. on that one. All right, uh, as Andy laid out, that Sweet 16 schedule coming up for you tonight. If you look at it, it's that left side of the bracket. Arizona Clemson will get things started. Then it'll be San Diego State and UConn. And then the nightcap. I think 9.30, 10 o'clock, maybe even 10.30. Uh, it'll be Alabama, UNC, which I think should be a great one. And then Illinois and Iowa State to round things out here on Thursday night. For the IU women, it'll be 5 o'clock tomorrow. Notre Dame, I think, is at 2, if I'm not mistaken. They've got Oregon State in the bottom part of that bracket. The top part of that bracket is undefeated South Carolina taking on Terry Moore and company. That is out in Albany. Don't ask me why it's out there. Uh, it'll be a 5 o'clock tip against the undefeated Gamecocks for a uh, year. I was going to make fun of Albany, but it's like 45 degrees. It's like, oh, it's about the same here. So, Did they make, you know. I, I should look this up. Did the IU women make the Elite Eight a few years ago? Or is Sweet 16 the furthest that they've gotten? Oh, don't quiz me on that. I want to say they lost to Arizona one year. I think they did, but don't quiz me on that. You'll have to look that up. You and Corbin look that I'll up. I'll look it up. Yeah, you go yeah, to look MLB. It up. I'll go to MLB. A couple different games today of note locally. Reds and Nationals. Great American Ballpark. That one at 410. The unfortunate news yesterday. Matt McClain, shoulder injury. Going to be out a while. We'll see if that's an entire season. But a couple injuries for the Reds as they get ready for this season. Cardinals on the road in L.A. facing the Dodgers. That's at 410 as well. And then Mark Dykton's Cubs in Texas taking on the Rangers. 735. It was a trip to the Elite Eight back in the old COVID tournament in San Antonio for the IU women. They upset, I remember that, number one seed uh, NC State uh, in the Sweet 16, 73-70. They lost to Arizona 66-53. So obviously quite the underdog tomorrow, uh, but they'll try and shock the world uh, coming up here 5 o'clock on Friday. All right, on the other side, Brian Newbert covers Purdue for Golden Black. He's in Detroit. Uh, We'll chat with him next. Do you need air conditioning service and need to find a local well-trained expert you can trust like family?
We felt bad yesterday. I even told him after the show, KB, uh, our guy, Scotty, Scotty J, Scotty Johnson. I'm like, sorry, we didn't use your pop quiz yesterday. Uh, we hope to get to that in about 15 minutes today. So uh, get lined up NCAA for that. tournament centric. I, ha- I haven't looked at it yet, is it? I would assume it was. I one thought- of the answers, the brother of this player will be uh, going against Purdue tomorrow night. Maybe okay. the Lance Jones matchup for okay. tomorrow night. I like that. Okay, so uh, to remember that, we'll get to that here uh, in about 15 minutes. Well, you know, every single day as Purdue is in the NCAA tournament, we've promised to give you a guest. We keep that going. Brian Newbert joins us. Uh, friendly to do so. Goldenblack.com, part of the On3 Network. Brian, good morning. You know, I wanted to start things off. I want to change things. Last segment, we talked about Trey Kaufman Wren and, you know, being a top 50 kid and, you know, kind of sitting for what the better part of uh, of a year and, you know, has really waited his time and has been inconsistent. But, you know, that Utah State game, especially at the beginning, he was so pivotal, ended up 18 points, eight rebounds in the win. Uh, how important is he going forward? And what did you make of his weekend, especially that Utah State game? Yeah, I think this is kind of what Purdue uh, had in mind when it, sort of crowbarred him into a starting job uh, back in the spring and summer. Uh, You know, I I think after the way last season ended, I think they decided they wanted more scorers on the floor at all times. And uh, he is certainly that that. now the issue, or at least the part of it that, you know, required some smoothing out that maybe didn't make a whole lot of sense on paper was the fact that Trey Kaufman ran is kind of a, low post back to the basket sort of guy and him and Zach Eady, how they, how they coexisted together in the same airspace was always going to be something that was going to require a little bit of a, a process. And I think they've kind of figured that, that out to the uh, best point it's been uh, all season long, but also even when that's not, uh, when he's not necessarily getting post touches through their offense, he's really effective on the offensive glass. He's really effective playing high low with Zach Eady and uh, just gives him one more guy who people have to worry about at the rim. And obviously you already have the preeminent guy in college basketball that you have to worry about at the rim. So I think um, what maybe they give up in spacing, they, they kind of make up for in an added uh, physical presence. And I think that's sort of how Purdue sets tones to start games with that physical presence around the basket between him and Zach Eady, much more so Zach Eady, obviously. Um, but he's just kind of in another layer to it. But, yeah, he's going to be pretty big here the rest of the way. They they need all the scoring they can get. They need all the rebounding they can get. They need all the, all the defense they can get. And he's gotten much better through the course of the year as a defender. He gets kind of chased into having to guard smaller, quicker guys on the perimeter sometimes because Purdue switches one through four a lot. And, uh, he's really improved in that regard uh, through the course of the season. So he – He's probably the best he's been at the right time right now. No better Purdue coverage than Brian Newbert. Again, Golden Black up in Detroit as things will get started tomorrow night, 739 for the Boilers against Gonzaga. Brian, I do want to go back to uh, the opening round weekend, and if I just threw out the your most encouraging sign from what you saw from Purdue, you would say what? Well, they're continuing to shoot the ball really well. I they did that all season, but you know, kind of the nature of three point shooting is that it can, the floor can drop out to me at any time. It never has all season long. Purdue's been really consistent. Purdue's been really good in that regard. That's what ended their season last year. That's really the face of how different this team is from a year ago. They're a 41% basically three point shooting team. Now it's never really ebbed and flowed uh, as it, it typically often does in basketball. That, Treykoff and Wren's play, uh, the fact Miles Colvin and Cam and Heidi are probably um, the best position they've been all season long to really help this team win when it matters. I think the athletic element, the defensive versatility, the shot making those guys can provide uh, off the bench uh, can be a pretty significant difference maker for this team on any given night here the rest of the way in the NCAA tournament. So those guys looking ready. Uh, to really play at the highest level at the right time. Uh, Probably a combination of those three things. But Purdue sort of was what Purdue's been all season long. They've just been very businesslike. They've been very driven. They've been very, um, very sharp, very good. Uh, um, It really has only been turnovers all season long that's gotten them beat. And I think what you saw against Utah State is 
There was a little bit of a spell there in the first half where they turned the ball over a few times. Utah State got some points off that. As soon as they cleaned that up, they kind of took off. And that's sort of the story of their season. Um, the fact that they didn't really extend that run of turnovers. I know that sounds like a backhanded compliment, but it really is the biggest deal for this team is when you look at their losses this season, all four of them, there have been too many turnovers and there have been 15 to 20 points off turnovers to the opponent. That's Purdue's best this season has never not been enough. And uh, when they're not turning the ball over, they're really, really good. And uh, that's just kind of the, kind of the thing to keep an eye on here the rest of the way. Yeah, 10 and 9, the turnover numbers opening round weekend. Again, anything under that magic number of 13, uh, Purdue has been undefeated this season. He is Brian Newbert, uh, covers Purdue, of course, for Golden Black. And, Brian, you've heard Zach Eady every step of the way throughout this season, you know, for national media or some people that maybe are just flying in and, and are hearing Eady talk for the first time all year, I think the takeaway has been like, whoa, uh, he looks like he's going into Manila tonight for some heavyweight <laughs> battle and, you know, whatever, how he's walking, how he's talking, all of that stuff. Uh, do you make anything of, I, I don't know, maybe the shortness, the conciseness, the directness of Zach Eady's comments over the last week, or is this something you feel like has been there all year? I think it's been there all year. I think it, it's just, it's been there all year in anticipation of this. So it's probably a little bit more amplified now, but he's been very businesslike, as I keep using that word. Uh, he's been kind of mad, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I think that... Um, you know, he took last season personally. This Purdue team as a whole, I think, has sort of taken things personally. And it's made them better. When you look at the way they played against against Indiana this year, I, I don't think they would have – I'm not sure the outcomes would have been as one-sided as they were had Indiana not swept them last season. I think they just take things personal. And um, I think I think Zach Eady's kind of been the face of it. He's He came back for this. I understand that, you know, everybody says that when they come back from school and when they come back to school. But I think he genuinely kind of views this as, I don't want to say a referendum on his greatness or something like that, but I think he wants to make things right from last season. And thus far this season, he's done done everything in his power to do that. He I, He's gotten much better from last season too. And he's he was the national player of the year last year by a, by a wide margin. And he, he's going to be again by a wide margin, I think, um, but there wasn't a whole lot of there wasn't a whole lot of margin there for him to get better because he was so dominant last season. But he has gotten a lot better. He's worked really hard. He's been really focused. He's been unbelievably consistent. Um, never has a bad game. Never has an off game. I mean, some games are better than others, obviously. But he's he just shows up every single night, every single play, and um, I just think he's he's really really motivated, and I think he's. Um, I keep saying all business right now, and that's uh, I think everybody's kind of seeing that. It's almost a scowl from Zach Eady. It's not a scowl, but at times uh, it definitely feels that way. Brian Newbert joining us, Golden Black. We're talking some Purdue here. He joins us on the Payless Liquors Hotline. You know, you look at the Zags, boy, round of 32, Gonzaga just dismantled Kansas. And we understand Kansas has had their issues, but Gonzaga, hot team. They've won 11 of 12. In fact, Brian, the last two and a half months, they've only lost to St. Mary's. That's the only team that lost twice to St. Mary's. These two teams. Purdue and Gonzaga faced off back in Maui in November. What do you take away from that game? And do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Or does it not matter for Purdue that they're facing somebody who they did play earlier this season? Well, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it helps it helps Gonzaga to have seen Zach Eady each of the last two seasons. Um, so there's not going to be that shock factor to start the game. I don't know if that helps Gonzaga as much as that just isn't the normal advantage it would be for Purdue because I think those first five minutes of every Purdue game is just something opponents can't simulate um, because you you just don't see a Zach Eady very often. You just don't see that level of physicality. Um, so I don't know if it necessarily I – and mean, I don't really know what the difference is here, but I don't know if it really makes Gonzaga better, helps Gonzaga as much. as It's just not that luxury Purdue normally has. Gonzaga's gotten better through the course of the year, but so is Purdue. Uh, I, I think that's sort of easy to, to kind of lose in this, is that Purdue's better now, too. I, I think Lance Jones is fully onboarded, even though he was really good in that game in Honolulu. 
I think Camden Heidi and Miles Coleman are playing very well. I think Trey Kaufman Ren and Zach Eady make more sense together than they ever have. Uh, this season, I think Purdue's kept shooting the ball really well. Um, I think this is the time of year you probably didn't want to get Purdue either because of everything I talked about earlier. Sure. So I think that, um, you know, for as much as, uh, as, as, as Gonzaga's gotten better, I think Purdue's probably gotten better too. I think it's a tough matchup for Gonzaga. I think the last two seasons have really underscored that, that, they really struggle uh, to match up with Edie as a lot of people would. Um, I think Braden Smith tends to play really well against them uh, as well. Um, but I just think Purdue's a better team too, and that shouldn't get lost in all of this. Uh, Gonzaga ended the season hot, but had to play their way into the NCAA tournament. Um, they did kind of route Kansas. Kansas has its circumstances, obviously, but they also beat a pretty good McNeese State team in the first round pretty one-sidedly that's a word um so yeah this is kind of a kind of a matchup but two pretty hot teams right now who know one another pretty well uh brian newbert again golden black he's in detroit uh coming up tomorrow night and brian shout out to carson cunningham who we had on the show yesterday or what was that tuesday now we wrote a great piece for you guys on just kind of why purdue has been purdue dating back to gene Cady and now Matt Painter, and I bring that up, and I think you saw this tweet, Brian, if I'm not mistaken. I think you retweeted it, so I hope I'm not catching you off guard. But Mark Adams, ESPN College Basketball Analyst, tweeted out the operating budgets of the Sweet 16 teams yeah. left in the mids tournament. Purdue was the third smallest at $8.8 million. I think San Diego State and Clemson, I believe, were the only – two that were smaller than that, and I would say if you look at the list, there are some teams significantly at a higher mark than Purdue. Did that surprise you at all to see Purdue like the third smallest of the Final 16? No, not really. Uh, what surprised me is I don't know how Duke spends $28 million bucks a year in basketball. But uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a lot, of private, a lot of private jets to go recruit, Brian. Are you taking a jet to the North Carolina game? <laughs> they're still they're still paying K, so uh, – <laughs> You know, Purdue's always run a pretty tight ship. A lot of their recruiting is done in Indiana. A lot of uh, – they don't necessarily always go coast-to-coast coast for recruiting, things like that. They don't break the bank on, facil on, on you know, bells and whistles, facilities, things like that, which isn't to say Purdue doesn't have nice things. Uh, I think Purdue has everything it needs. It's just – they historically just haven't spent for the sake of spending. Uh, you know, I, I think Matt Painter's pretty well – compensated i think he'd probably tell you that um i think he has everything he needs from a staff standpoint he's not one of those guys who needs 20 people on his staff for just to have 20 people on his staff i i think you know he he has the guys he, he wants in his program he has enough support positions in his program you know sort of things like that i, I just don't think um you know purdue needs a whole lot more now every coach wants more uh i just don't think painters Every coach, I think he's he's okay running a pretty uh, a pretty minimalist operation and making the most of what he has. Uh, I think that's what Purdue does. Ryan, last one before we let you go. It certainly sounded like Mackey South uh, over the weekend. I assume there could be some Mackey Northeast vibes coming up Friday. You want to take a stab at percentage of Boiler fans you think will be in that place come tomorrow night? Yeah, it, it, it's kind of tough in the NCAA tournament because the people who are here for the other games, too, those seats often go empty uh, during the other sessions. Um, but I think that uh, there will be a pretty decided Purdue advantage up here again um, this season. But Purdue's had that situation before and lost, uh, too. So it's not like that is the singular difference maker in some of these games. I can't imagine Gonzaga having a ton of people here. Um I'm trying to think of who else is here. Well, I would think honestly, head. and Andy, you can speak to this. I would think more Creighton fans than Tennessee fans, maybe. Y yeah, Brian, yeah. I was I, I was at the Creighton uh, San Diego State Elite Eight game that was in Louisville last year. You know that pod, and they had a significant advantage. Now they had San Diego State as well. Yeah. No, I, I think Purdue will have the most, but I don't think Creighton will be too far behind. I think they'll bring a lot of people. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. The that wouldn't surprise me one bit. Tennessee has always traveled well. I've, I've, you know, Purdue has kind of this serendipitous relationship with Tennessee, where they oftentimes end up in the same places. They, 
uh, obviously played earlier this year in Honolulu. They played in the NCAA tournament years back. They played in Atlantis a few years ago, and they've always they've always turned out pretty well for a football school. Um, and uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Tennessee has a good number of people here as well. Um, but no, I I would anticipate you know kind of being in the Midwest footprint here. The Big Ten, the traditional Big Ten footprint, the whole country is the Big Ten footprint right now. Um, but I think that there will be quite a few Purdue fans here. Now, you know, back in 2019, Purdue had a, a kind of a de facto home home court advantage against Virginia, and obviously that went south on them uh, at the very end. Um, they did have a lot of people at that Tennessee game, the game before, and that took a a foul on the final play of regulation, I think, to get that game to overtime. Uh, so it's not like Purdue is necessarily guaranteed to blow people out of the water just because they have a 70-30 uh, fan advantage sort of thing. But it certainly doesn't hurt. You'd certainly uh, rather have that than the alternative. Sure. It's uh, nice to just hop in the car for both of these uh, region sites so far, and we'll see if plane travel is on the schedule of Brian Newbert coming up next week. Uh, as the Final Four is out in Phoenix. Brian, great stuff all year long. Really appreciate when you hop on with us. Uh, safe travels back from Detroit, and uh, hopefully we're talking to you next week. Thanks, folks. Brian Thank Newbert, you. Payless Liquors Hotline. Again, 739 tomorrow night. And if you want to look ahead to Sunday, uh, 220 or 5 o'clock. I want to say it might even be 505. Those are the two Elite Eight tip times. For Sunday, so Purdue will be slotted into one of those if they win. Yeah, it's the first thing I don't like about Matt Painter. I mean, come on, you got to complain about all the other things. You got to build a new facility every five or six years. What are you doing, Scotty? Gotta... Purdue does not have a practice facility. Is that right for basketball? Oh, that yeah. that's that's the craziest thing I've ever right. heard. I mean, it's I... literally that's the craziest yeah. thing I've ever. I mean, heard. I've been to Notre Dame's practice facility. It's incredible. Um, yeah, it's just wild. When I saw that stat laid out. Uh, and, you know, we won't get too much into it, but, I mean, the operating budgets for some of these teams, it was astronomical. Uh, and I get that, you know, the coastal teams, it plays a little bit more into it. Uh, you know, UConn, Duke, Gonzaga, those are the teams pretty high up on that list. But still, some schools you wouldn't even think would be higher yeah. than Purdue are higher. Just goes to show you, again, the impressive nature to what they have built. All right, we'll round it out with the pop quiz. It's an NCAA-centric pop quiz, 317-239-1070. Give us a call. Hey, we're David and Greg Figueroa. Founders of Melinda's Hot Sauce.
Sharpen your pencils. It's time for the Pop Quiz with KB and Andy. Brought to you by Jiffy Lube, Indiana's favorite oil change since 1985. All right, Pop Quiz time. I want to give away an oil change on this Thursday. We do need to correct one thing, and Corbin, you took the call so you could help me here. This did sound like insanity. Purdue does have a basketball facility. <laughs> oh, they, they do have a practice facility? Yeah, what's the name? Do you remember the name, Corbin? Because someone Cardinal called it. Court. Okay, because yeah, someone Court. someone called in and said, what, what the hell are you guys talking about? So there you go. Called what? Cardinal, Cardinal Court. Court. Is this for Brian or is that a dumb comment? Now, that I do not know. Someone else call in and talk to Corbin. I do not know the answer uh, Part of the Mackey to Complex that. Project, Cardinal Court, opened in 2011. God, so, the, so is it on site there? Because remember Matt Painter. Oh, pa- it is Brian. Brian and Danielle, Re- Cor- remember, Danielle Cardinal. Remember Matt Painter, and this might have been it. Remember when he flirted with Missouri? Boy, I don't know if you would. He flirted yeah, that was with a Missouri. While back, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if it was right around that. He probably wanted something, you know, more money, more money for his coaches, a difference in uh, staff, but. We don't need to talk about any of that stuff. Let's get going here. Uh, who do you want to go? What caller number? Uh, let's let's you go pick. with Fast Fingers here because we're kind of up against it. Caller number one. We have Colin. Colin, good morning, man. How are you? What's going on? Hey, good. How are you guys today? I'm in a rabbit hole looking at this Cardinal Court. We're great, Colin. Colin, how's your bracket looking? Um, I'm in the last place <laughs> in all of my brackets. Well, <laughs> Colin. Who the hell did you have? Um, well, I took uh, I did take UConn to win, but I had a lot of uh, upsets in the first round that didn't happen. My uh, my four year old actually has a better bracket than I do right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it R- happens. Rosie had beat me in round one. I thought he had a Kentucky Auburn <laughs> title game. All right, Colin, we got to go a little rapid fire. Andy, lead us off. All right, question number one: Purdue takes on Gonzaga in the NCAA men's tournament tomorrow night. That's in Detroit. Who leads the all-time series between Purdue and Gonzaga? Um, I believe that would be Purdue. Number two here. The Pacers lost to the Bulls last night in Chicago. Who was the team's leading scorer? Oh, gosh. Pascal Siakam, Miles Turner, Tyrese Halliburton, Andrew Nemhard. We gave this answer out about 15 minutes ago. You did. It was a terrible game, by the way. Um, I think it was was Nemhard, wasn't it? Here we go, in. two for two. Number three, yesterday marked the 85th this anniversary. This is like the four-year-old's bracket, yeah, it not is. Collins' bracket. So <laughs> yesterday far. marked the 85th anniversary of the first championship game in NCAA men's basketball tournament history. Who won the first NCAA tournament in 1939? Ohio State, Oregon, Wisconsin, or Kansas? That would be, um, uh, um, that'd be Oregon. It would be if they if they advance. You like this guy? Did you if catch they, the duck sound? Yeah, I or did. No? If they oh. advance in the tournament, they bring the trophy with them, actually, and put it in the media room. Anyway, they really? Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Seems a bit much. Uh, uh, Colin, where did the 1939 turn or championship game? Uh, where was that played? Excuse me. 1939 championship game played. Kansas City, Lawrence, Kansas, New York City, or Evanston? Oh gosh, um, I have a guy. Was it Evanston? Last one. We got to be quick here. We have under a minute. Happy 80th birthday to basketball Hall of Famer Rick Barry. Barry won an ABA championship with the Oakland Oaks and an NBA title with the Golden State Warriors. Who is the only player to win an NCAA basketball championship, an ABA championship, and an NBA uh, championship as a player? Give you three names. Tom Thacker, Larry, is it Siegfried, Ron Bonham? Oh, gosh. Um... Larry Sixfried. Unbelievable. Four of five right there. We're <sighs> up against good. it. The last one, Tom Thacker, Tom Thacker there. Cincinnati product, Boston Celtics, and the Pacers. He did good, though, man. Nice job there, Heartbreak. Colin, on that. Thank you to Rick Venturi. Outstanding today. Sweet 16 tonight. Everybody have a great one. The Ride with JMV. Colts Hall of Famer Edger and James joins us. Hey,